going to come back from recess for our 2023 budget deliberations. Uh, we're looking at the Wednesday, November 23rd agenda, and I will turn it over to administration for review and general discussion. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. So there was just two questions that came out of our first day of budget deliberations. So um, we do, will have answers for those questions this afternoon. So one was around the new Surreptive Force Main project that was in the long range plan, as well as uh, some of the amounts that were printed for our resident guide. So we will have that information for you later today. So going right into the next agenda item, unless Council has any, uh, any questions further? from yesterday that they'd like to add. Any further questions? I am seeing none, and uh, we trust that you'll track our questions today. Anything we can't answer, we'll provide either in the afternoon or next week. Okay. Absolutely. So going to tab 10, we have our new initiatives plan. So we have four new initiatives um, on this plan. This is Information Council has seen uh, most of the information on this plan previously through workshop. However, we do have one new initiative that was added since that time, and that was the procurement and accounting services new initiative. So um, just going through briefly on uh, the first one, senior grant funding, that's a new grant funding program specifically targeting programs for seniors. So it ties closely to county or council's new strategic plan um, and deep community connections as a pillar. So again, it would follow a same process as what we do for other grants, community grants, and um, there'd be an application process for this program. So that um, as part of the new initiative document, it just speaks to that each grant would be less than $2,000 to allow for 10 unique programs to be added to this region in 2023. Are there any questions on the senior grant funding new initiative? Questions? And we had an opportunity to hear from Mr. Honesty a little bit about that yesterday, a part of it. And uh, so, no, I think we're good and we know it fits closely with our strategic plan. Thank okay. you. So the next new initiative is the online campground reservation. So you'll notice that this does not have a budget impact, but I wanted to highlight, we speak to really adding this as a service as people that do camping uh, really do rely on an online um, ability to do these bookings. So this would add this service uh, for Leduc County campgrounds. So benefits of an online reservation system are included in the business case for this new initiative. Um, there's no increased cost. However, the plan would be to pass the cost on for this um, software subscription onto the users of the service. So that would be added to the fee. So when you do a campground reservation, um, we're still in the midst of doing the work um, to do the research on the platform that we would like to proceed with. So we don't have a definitive um, cost on that per transaction um, cost to the user, but it would be approximately three to five dollars per reservation. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Lewis. Thank you. Will residents or users of the campground still have the opportunity to phone in or will it be strictly uh, online? So they, um, in the new initiative, it still speaks to the requirement to have um, somebody available to answer a phone call. So that would would be available as well. And I really appreciate that this is a user pay because it is a very small percentage of our population that would be using it. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping it'll work out well. Okay. Any questions on this new initiative? Further questions? Okay, so going to the next new initiative, we, we have procurement and accounting services. I'll spend a little bit more time on this one as it is the first time that council has, has seen this new initiative. So this um, new initiative is looking to add two new positions within the finance department. So one position is a manager of procurement um, would, would, who would focus on procurement throughout the organization in order to enhance our internal levels of service, identify interdepartmental opportunities and efficiencies, reduce costs while maintaining a fair, open, transparent process that considers best value to meet the needs of the county. And the second position 
is an accounting technician position, which would assist the department with current operational needs, which have increased over the past five years. And we also have outlined um, some of the work that has been added within the finance department to warrant uh, an additional resource within the department. So with a procurement manager, we see the value of a, this type of position that can put additional focus on procurement practices to have that best value added uh, to the organization. We have outlined some of the, you know, the benefits that we believe would exist for this type of position. We, we do have um, a significant uh, budget that I think this type of focus uh, would really be a benefit um, to the organization. So we, we believe that it'd be reducing risk by having a specialist who can advise on legal, legislative, and trade agreement requirements on, on procurement. Uh, we have that established focus on procurement within the organization and provide support to all departments. Uh, we'd be reducing costs without comprise, uh, compromising quality or features of what we are purchasing. We'd create operational efficiencies where applicable by establishing a multi-year plan in collaboration with departments. And we'd be focusing on corporate-wide analysis, um, such as a lease versus buy decision um, to inform decision-making. So we currently, the procurement in the organization is a decentralized process. The plan here is one individual cannot possibly take on procurement for the entire organization. Um, so there would still be um, you know, involvement by department staff in procurement. However, there are certain um, things that could be done in a more centralized way that I think would give us better value for our money. So for example, if we have um, you know, an external service provider for uh, snow removal at a couple of our external facilities, well, packaging that together into one contract as opposed to every facility having its individual contract um, would be a benefit. And I would expect that we would realize cost savings um, with pooling certain uh, services and goods together to buy at larger volumes or a larger contract, which would give us better value for our dollar. We, we talk about in the business case just around if we were to realize just a 2% savings within just our goods, supplies, and materials budget, that would reduce our costs of 150000 We really believe, I, I can't quantify for you specifically what this position will save in the organization, but we believe that with this focus of this position on procurement, that it wouldn't be unreasonable to be able to see um, savings realized. And that's just one small component of, of our, our budget is that good supplies and materials. Any questions specifically on the procurement manager position? I have four. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, is there a training to do this job or is this just somebody who's been in procurement for years? Uh, there's actually specific okay. programs for procurement and designations for uh, and, procurement as well. And we'd be looking for that. I, I would expect that's what we would be looking for, just because especially when you're bringing somebody in to develop yeah. a new way and really needs to be somebody who can collaborate with all of the departments um, and, and be really effective okay. in that manner. So I would expect that we would be looking for that education specifically, as okay. well as that designation. No, that's good. I didn't, I didn't know that. Um, yes. Second question uh, and forgive, is it going to be somebody who's buying everything from toilet paper to technicians? Is that what this procurement is? It's including it, people. Um, I wouldn't expect they would be, I mean, services, okay. services. but not Except yeah, not yep. people. Got it. Yep. Yeah. We used to talk about in the school board, we we budgeted for toilet paper to teachers, right? So this yeah. is kind of my same. Yeah, so that. definitely the uh, the people side in terms of the staffing would not be something that this position would have a part of that would still okay. remain with human resources. Um, you talked about it wouldn't take all of the work away from departments. Would it be a consistent framework about what level departments would be purchasing then and what level the procurement officer would be doing? Would that be something that would be created and then followed through? The yes. I, well, I think, you know, one of the initial pieces of how I, I would foresee this per person coming into the organization is really doing the evaluation of, 
you know, where are maybe some of the quick wins of a centralized okay. procurement on certain things? So really look to, to some of those quick wins right. that we could have that really dis, doesn't make sense that um, we have a staff in the COC building, um, you know, purchasing paper towel right. or, or paper. Baby, baby, yeah, yeah, that we could just pool everybody's needs okay. together. So I think we would look to find some quick wins because then it just demonstrates value for our investment in this position. And then I think there'd be the benefits of those conversations to say, okay, where can we further support? You know, I, I would say that we have a lot of staff with a lot of work on their plates, and this could help alleviate a little bit of a workload for many people because it can definitely has a corporate wide impact for many staff. And then the benefit of that is again, I think better value for our dollar. And that was going to be my last question, uh, Ms. Klamosko, is that it will be taking the plates off somebody in every department, which will help because generally procurement's done on the side of your desk. So this will create a more focused way to procure. So I'm good. Thank you. Any other questions on the procurement manager position? I am seeing none. All right. So the next position is an accounting technician position. So again, we, when we implemented certain processes within the finance department, we actually reduced um, our full-time equivalency positions within the department uh, back in 2020. So there has been many um, new levels of service introduced over the last five years that an accounting technician could really support um, doing components of a lot of different work within the department to assist um, you know, freeing up capacity with other staff to do higher level work um, and different pieces. So what's been done in the business case is just a listing of you know, new things that uh, finance has started to do for the organization. So I'll just highlight a few of those. So we have introduced quarterly reporting. So that's a big piece of work within the finance department. There's a lot of uh, kind of moving parts to pulling that quarterly reporting together um, and working and collaborating with departments to, to look at variance explanations and, 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 pull, and look at our major projects and our capital project plan um, status and all of those pieces. So I think that's been a big piece of work that's been added within the department. We also, in recent years, developed an investment policy and strategy. So now there is um, complexity to external investing and the, the accounting uh, practices that you have to do to report that properly. So that actually has been, um, you know, a, a good piece of work also that's been added, but has definitely, I mean, we are benefiting from the additional interest revenue in, in a very significant way. So it's time well spent for sure. Uh, we also have additional cash receiving processes. So we've really have expanded this service offerings in terms of things on our website. So with that comes um, the downloading of information from the website to actually put it into our financial software. So that definitely has increased um, some workload there. And gravel processing also with our rural road initiative, as well as um, our change to when we do our gravel graveling program, also has added the requirement for additional time invested in our gravel, um, the payment to our truckers and also the just accounting for our gravel inventories. So that has been a significant addition of work. So then there's just a few other uh, points within um, there's some additional work that's been taken off of corporate services played in terms of filing and, and that piece. And then we've had additional financial software modules introduced into um, Serenic that have added some, you know, administrative time in terms of tickets and, and maintenance and user um, security um, maintenance and those pieces. And as well as we put a lot of focus in the last number of years in asset management. So we definitely have quite a few staff within the finance department contributing to work within the asset management program. So those are just some highlights of the different components of work that's being done in finance. And we believe that this accounting technician position would be a great benefit to support uh, the work <laughs> that finance is doing in all of those different areas. Are there any questions on the accounting technician role? Questions? I have a couple. 
Um, one of the things we've done in the last, I don't know, I've been here nine years, is we continue to invest in software to make people's work easier and more efficient, which I thought would allow us to hire less people, especially for something like this, which I would assume a lot of it is done uh, through software and computer programming. How come we're continuing to have to add people while we're adding expensive software? So I think um, it, there's work that we have been able to produce um, a lot of different work with the addition of certain software. So our, our budgeting module that we use now for our, our budgeting purposes has added an ability to, to do budget in a way that I believe is more understandable to the public and to council, breaking things down from a service area perspective for, rather than a general ledger account perspective. So while that software allowed us to show budget in a different way, um, you still have to produce the reports and there's an analysis that needs to happen um, when you're pulling information out. So I do think that um, you're, you're never going to fully eliminate the need for the staff to then critically look at or pull information out of these systems. But I would say that the quality of, of the documents that we're getting out of current systems is is much more user friendly and meaningful um, for the public. Now, you know, we were able to reduce that position back in 2020. A big piece of that was within our employee self service system. So we went to a lot of automation within our payroll. Mm -hmm. So really, um, you know, we've seen great benefits in that. And we've, we've actually now in 2022, I think we were just finalizing the bringing online of our fire services. So we're going to be completing all of staff are now going to be within the ESS system. So that's, that's been a huge change in time within the finance department. But I think that all of these um, value add things that I think we're doing as an organization need the, you know, the professionals, accounting technicians, accountants to be able to do the work and analyze the work and put it out for public. Okay. Councillor Smith. Again, I can what you've talked about today, what you've added are things we talked about. The first one is the introduction of quarterly reporting, which requires a very in-depth, easy follow. Um, council can really take care of it. I totally support the extra people. You, you have strategic people that you're adding and you've already showed the benefits of cost recovery through having the people through proc uh, procurement or else a, a technician that's taking care of looks like 10 extra programs that we dumped on you guys. So I'm always aware of the capacity of what we ask our administration to do. The two positions, you have assured us that there'll be returns on savings just through efficiencies. Um, as for the software, funded every year, but unfortunately people need, over need to see all these cost saving, time saving things. And I'll just go to Twitter. They're starting to realize that people need to oversee the software. It just doesn't operate by itself. Another one, which is uh, what we talked about is we're doing a phone review. And some of you probably remember when we did the phone review and brought in our phones. Uh, um, so, I mean, it's just, it's natural. Um, so definitely I'll be supportive of, um, of your positions. And I also appreciate that you've shown there's a cost recovery because of efficiencies that you'll be building in with these. And we, are an organization that continues to grow. Not only are we having some of this, but um, we have lots of development that's going on. So thank you for the in-depth reporting. You, you've justified it. Um, and again, I, I'm just aware that what we're asking you to do increases every year. So thanks for that. And again, the cost recovery is much appreciated. Any further questions, comments? All right, moving on. Okay, so the next new initiative is the Economic Development Summit. So again, this is information council has seen. We've, we've held two economic development summits in the past, one in fall 2019 and spring of 2022. Um, what we're realizing is that we want to um, invest some dollars into hosting that summit just to look at being able to um, bring in and pay for some speakers for the summit. The vision going forward is to bring in those higher level speakers on a fee for service basis and charge some type of recovery admission fee to the event. It's not meant to be a moneymaker, but rather just to cover some costs. 
So really, um, it looks to focus on really building the Duke County brand. It's an opportunity for the county to tell our story and to market investment opportunities within the county. So really we'll, wanting to build on previous successes with the summit uh, moving forward. So I think, again, we have discussed an investment strategy with council just at a workshop level. Nothing has been approved to date. However, this is something that um, has been noted as a priority for the county just to build our economic development presence and our brand within the region. So are there any questions on this new initiative? Go ahead, Councillor Smith. I think I saw somewhere this is going to be an agricultural based one again, and the $15,000 is pretty cheap. If you have to focus on another econo uh, economic summit on agriculture, can we do one on the rest of the business and double that to 30? You can do your ag one. I didn't attend last time because I think we're selling ourselves short on what's going on in the airport, what's going on in logistics, what's going on in our park. We've already focused on ag, so we'll spend your 15 on another ag one. But I'd like to see it doubled and do two of them, and then we could focus on the rest of the development in Ladue County, which is important to the people in oil and gas at the airport, logistics. So we're leaving 90% of our stakeholders out by continuing to do the egg thing, the egg thing. So go ahead, spend your 50, but I would advocate today you can put that in for a question and we do two of them, add 15,000, and we do one that which is the rest of the economic development in Ladue County. Thank you. Have we determined the topic of this economic development summit? No, Madam Chair. The, the intent would be to do something different than AG in 2023. Okay. Um, and again, uh, what was what was very uh, successful actually about last year is that many of our secondary producers, like a Will Muncie with his uh, metery, said, wow, I've learned a lot just by listening to the people on the panel. And, and so it was a really good connection there. So um, I believe it's an important piece to do. I know that our uh, neighboring municipalities who attended uh, thought it was a good way to not only network, but to learn a little bit. So uh, be looking forward to the discussion on what the topic will be for 2023. Okay. Thank you. So are there any questions for any of those new initiatives? If not, we would move to major and capital project plans under tab 11. Okay. Tab 11. So one thing I wanted to highlight on this summary page, so on this 2023 interim budget funding and expenditure summary, the one thing I wanted to note to council is when we talked about the budget guidelines yesterday and we spoke to the investment of uh, $5.5 million of tax dollars to fund major projects and capital project plans, um, just in that funding, you'll see um, under municipal taxes, we have utilized 4.7 million. So I wanted to highlight because the budget guideline had said 5.5, we have not used 5.5 million of taxes for the major and capital project plans. We will go through in more detail. Um, you'll see all of the different funding sources that have been identified, but I just wanted to highlight that difference just because it wasn't something noted in the budget guideline. Okay, any questions on that? Nope. So then the next uh, couple of pages in your binder just have information shown in different ways, just to, you know, kind of breaking it down in, in different ways for information for council and the public. So um, my plan, unless there's a question on any of these graphs is to just move forward from there. Yeah. Do you see off site levies increasing uh, availability to continue to pay? I see what do you have less than 1% there right now? Is, do you anticipate an increase going forward in that area? Well, we we have received um, some offsite levy revenue in 2022. I, there has been you know significant development um, occurring, so I I do believe that we're going to continue to to see some dollars come in for offsite levy revenue now. Right now, in terms of a funding source, the utilization off of offsite. Um, levies are utilized for some of the debenture payments at this time. Okay. So we'll the un, behind the first blue page in your binder we have our major project plan. 
So we have a breakdown at the start here that just shows we have a major project plan of just under $2 million. And then it breaks down the funding to fund that 1.9 million. So we have uh, municipal taxes of 937,000 and reserves of just over a million dollars. So going to the next page, which breaks down all the projects within the major project plan. Again, um, you know, some of the, well, this plan is something that council has seen uh, previously through council workshop. So I will go through some of these fairly briefly because it's things that we have seen also in previous years. And so we have um, Kavanaugh, Kavanaugh landfill reclamation again, final year in order for us to receive our certificate of reclamation on that landfill. And if I will just be going through the projects, please, if you have a question, um, let me know and I, I can definitely address that question. The next one is a project at intersection Sparrow Drive and Highway 625 to do an assessment there about some improvements to that intersection. So that's a $20,000 project. Ms. Klamosko, I assume mm -hmm. that's going out for a consultant, is that correct? The $20,000? Yes. So we don't have the expertise in our engineering department to do assessments? Is it something more special, for lack of better, bad terms? So um, I do believe we do have um, engineering expertise to do assessments with, with this due to whether it's capacity or also some specific um, information they want to gather from external professional services. That would be my expectation as to why a project has been submitted. Thank you, Councillor Lewis. Uh, is there any uh, part for the province to play in this, considering that is a highway intersection as well? Yes. Yeah. Would we be expecting AT to so, so the uh, Alberta Transportation will be consulted in, on the study. Uh, the expectation is it's our intersection, okay. it's our interface, uh, so we'd be required to pay. This is we're looking beyond just the main intersection treatment yeah. as well. We're looking back at the parking and, right. and transecting of the new development okay. uh, to the to the north. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, also just further information conversations our director of engineering and utilities would also have conversations about um potential alberta transportation contrib contribution but that's uncertain at this point so the next project we have the municipal development plan interim review the fifteen thousand dollars proposed here this work is being done internally um, there'd be some public participation costs associated with this interim review so the next project, um, this is one that we have every year where we make contributions to our partners' recreation um, capital projects. So this is a consistent number that we have had for a number of years of 350000 The next project is our Beaumont Sports and Recreation Centre contribution. Again, this was a five-year commitment that the county had made. Uh, for their new recreation center. So our final payment is 400,000. The total contribution to this project was $2.4 million. The next um, item is a citizen satisfaction survey. So this will be our second citizen satisfaction survey. We did complete one two years ago. So this is a uh, further commitment to go back to our citizens to gather their feedback on the services we provide. So this is um, some professional services, as well as costs around public participation for this initiative. Uh, the next project is, again, a multi-year initiative, so the continuation of the work on our enterprise content management system replacement. So we are looking um, for, you know, further implementation to replace our permitting um, our, our record system, as well as our customer service database. So there's just additional funds required uh, to do that project. Councillor Lewis. Thank you. Will this eliminate a position in the planning department, the permitting, or is this just to help them with their load that they have to carry? So really it's about, um, we're moving away from utilizing on base as our, 
um, records management software. OnBase was customized to create a workflow to do a permitting workflow, which it was never intended to be used in that way. So it was a lot of customization and we were, were seeing a lot of increased cost to when you customize software to do things that they weren't really built to do. There's complications with that. So really we're looking at replacing and, and that on base system with a specific permitting system designed to do exactly the work of planning and development. So it would not result in the reduction of staff. However, it's a replacement of what we currently use within the on base system. Yep. So further. just an, if this is an internal, not an outward facing permitting system. So someone can't go on this and apply for a permit, right? Maybe I'm getting confused with the terminology. Yeah. Um, in terms of where we have not picked uh, a system at this point in terms of what we're going to replace it with, will there be some online capability for, you know, submission of information? You know, I think that is part of the scope of work within the RFP that is being, you know, being looked at. I think we actually have, um, we're doing the review of RFP submissions right now. So the potential of what can be done in the future in terms of increasing um, work that can be done by the public online, I don't have certainty of what that would look like at this point, but I would expect um, there could be some of that functionality built in. Go ahead, Alan. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just quickly add, like, one of the other reasons behind this is it's going to allow us to integrate our system, which is a little older, uh, with Edmonton and airports. Okay. Um, so it'll be a lot more digitally focused where we can transfer documents and share documents and um, it'll be a smoother collaboration between us and them. Our existing system basically is only allowing us internally to do digital. This is gonna, we're working with them actually on this um, review of, of vendors. And if we're in the process, it looks like we're probably going to make something that's going to work for them and us. So it'll make it a lot smoother and hopefully we get a lot of growth at the airport. So. Make the right work easy and people will do it. Okay, thank you. Thank you for those explanations. Anything further on uh, the laser fish? Oh. So the next project is the North Nisku Local Area Structure Plan. So it is looking at um, the area in North Nisku to create that area structure plan. It, so that is bringing in external professional services. There's a lot of a development occurring in that area, so it's becoming important yes. to have that foundational uh, piece of work done so that we can expedite development um, in that area as it comes. The next project is building life cycle maintenance black gold. So again, we co-own um, our services and our county center building with the black gold school division. So this is work that's been identified um, between the two organizations to be done in 2023. And that is 50% of the total cost. Of the next project is building life cycle maintenance. So this is for county owned facilities. So we bear 100% of this cost. So this uh, project profile document had outlined various work that we were going to complete uh, in our buildings for 2023. And we had an opportunity through workshop to talk in detail about these as well. Thank yes. you. The next item is uh, storm sewer drainage improvements in Lucas Estates. So um, just some drainage issues are existing within that uh, area of the county. So doing some improvements there within that, that area. What's the danger of perhaps putting this off a year? I mean, I hear that the swale holds water. I think every ditch holds water. Um, I actually see that there might be some, uh, what do you call them, reeds in there, which I think makes it a wetland, which <laughs> creates another issue, but I won't go there. 
Um, is it, is it the, I assume the worry is that it'll back up into, into where people are living, but in a major rainfall, could we not just pump that through? Is it, is it critical? And maybe that's a question then for our engineering staff. Is it critical that we do it in 2023? Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Lewis or Councillor um, Smith? Uh, uh, I've done a little bit of research on it. There's been some changes in the drainage with, I believe it's Churchill area where there was a subdivision that went in. And so the story, maybe some of the water may head south and not through here. I have gone over this over the last two years and I was there before the snow when there was nothing. Of course, water comes and goes. Um, I can't support a quarter million dollars to do that this year. I'd like to see what happens with the alleged changes in the drainage from the new subdivision. And again, if there's a, um, I have water in my ditch, but water is part of our natural world. And I can feel that sometimes the water comes, gets, goes in a ditch in front of somebody's house. But I, I, again, I need more data. If it fails again this year and it fills up with water, one of the areas we can look at is um, the reeds in the bottom will collect the water, maybe just a little bit more maintenance up the slope so the water can maybe flow. But definitely, I would appeal to council. This is an easy $250,000 save, which is close to what, 0.8-ish, 0.7 tax increase. So uh, discussion going forward, again, just looking for other people, but I can't support the quarter million this year. Maybe it'll come back next year. Uh, Councilor Lewis? I have the same views, looking for six residential lots to fix the water. Not that the water isn't a concern, but I think to this um it's it's been managed it seems like maintenance is happening in there uh without our us stepping in and i would be okay if we push this off as well and and i would i um and thank you for those additional comments i also believe that if we were to have a major rainfall and something to happen we also have the ability to take out a three inch pump and pump it through and and be okay for that time so can we just put this on the maybe list thank you yes so the next project is the Nisku Salt Shed overhead door. So again, it's it's just closing up um, that salt shed and the benefits as to why that's important has been outlined in the project profile document. And then the final project on the major project plan is the labor force analysis. So again, this piece ties specifically to the work in our investment strategy. So again, how important it is for our organization to have certain data in order to be able to uh, inform that investment strategy. Um, Councillor Lewis. Thank you. We talked about uh, the work per sector. Do you know what four sectors we'd be looking at? Are those those sectors okay. we're focused on? So yes. Uh, manufacturing, energy, agribusiness. Yeah. So um, I, I can I can formally get <laughs> what the four sectors. Yeah, energy, energy, yeah, energy. Um, may I ask a question, Ms. Klamosko? I mm -hmm. see that our engineering um, are in for this afternoon. If they could be prepared to answer the question about why we can't internally do the 20, the uh, intersection sure. assessment, please, if they could be prepared to answer that. And if not today, then the next day, because again, I believe we have three engineers in that department. And unless it's a real specialty piece, um, we might be able to shift some work around and get it done. Thank you. Yes, we will uh, get that answer for you. Yeah. So if there's no further questions on the major project plans, then I would turn the next blue page over. Uh, to go to our capital project plan. Uh, so we have again, same type of funding and expenditure summary. So we have a total capital project plan of just over $23 million. And then the funding is, is broken down below that. Um, so municipal taxes, grants, um, some utility reserves, and then some other reserve other reserves and sale trade-ins. It's all outlined there. So going to the next page, we have the detailed uh, project listing. So going to that first project, CP001, we have the new Sarepta Reservoir Pump House and Bulk Water Station upgrade design. Um, so that is being funded by utilities reserves for 230000 Again, this is a plan that council 
we have discussed previously within workshops. So if there's any questions, otherwise I will keep okay. going Council through. Lewis. Sorry, can you, there's nothing projected for what uh, future costs might be for this work. This is just $230,000 for the design. We'll pull it, that information from the long range. Okay. It, uh, it looks plan. like we know what we need to do there. So I, I don't know if that. Well, we, um, so this would be for, for design work to be able to get the detailed design to be able to complete the work the, the following year. So I will put, I'll have Ms. Weiss uh, pull some information sure. about what that the capital project would look like. I guess I'm looking yeah. for what the future costs would be. Yeah. Like so in design. the long range capital plan, that project would be uh, $2.4 million. It's anticipated again until it's it's a bit cautionary that until we do that detailed design, um, well, we try to estimate, um, you know, with all of our pro professional expertise as closely as possible. There's also uncertainties uh, with that. So we have put in 2.4 million at this time based on what we know today uh, for that project. Councillor Smith. And it is, again, with the design there, you could probably get grant funding and be shovel ready. It is $230,000. I am okay with moving in a couple of years down the road. However, if you do, there's an $80,000 turnaround that isn't a nice to have. It's required if we're not going to do any work out there because we had talked about the $80,000, somebody coming in and doing the road, and then they kind of went, hey, we're going to do design, and hey, maybe we're going to build, which means that heated pad that they talked about the roundabout or the turnaround would be there so i'm okay with dumping the 230 in design but that just means we can't go for grant funding because we're not shovel ready and there is a lot of money in sewage in infrastructure through the federal government and the provincial government so again it's up to council but uh, just a caution if we do it i will be asking that we do that turnaround and i have a variety of satellite photos we've upgraded water um, out at the plant for farmers, you know, there's other good points that are doing it. We've upgraded in NISCU. It's time to at least do a turnaround where I don't have six people sitting on the road and then waiting your turn to back in on the other person. So dump the 230, move it down the road. I I can live with that, but realize that there'll be a throwaway cost of 80,000 that I'll be asking for, for the road. Uh, and again, we're not prepared to move into grant requests if we don't have design. It is also a, a project that um, when we had council had had a conversation uh, with Minister Wilson, he we just spoke about some priority projects in that area. And that was yep. one project that we had sp spoken about. All right. Thank you. So the next project uh, is Centennial Park Campground Playground Replacement. So again, um, the age of the playground um, is getting... Um, up there so looking at replacing with current standards um <clears throat> so we're not going to get anything like this picture for sixty thousand dollars so let me just start by saying that we might get the slide um <laughs> and move the swings over um is there also a requirement and perhaps this is a parks question that these then be inspected on a regular basis i'm seeing a yes from miss weiss Yes, I'm not certain on what the exact time frame yeah. is, but there is an expectation. Okay, and that would be that an operational there. cost that would yeah. be borne by. Okay. Um, and I, I do think that that is work that, you know, our parks and recreation staff are doing um, in terms yeah. of that inspection and, and why this is being brought forward. Yeah, I think it's kind of above us yeah. to be inspected, but I don't yeah. know for sure. Okay, thank you. So we have the next project is uh, sand spreader stands uh, for our trucks. So looking at putting the stands on all of our fleet, um, just so that we can move away from the chain system that is currently being used. Okay, we did discuss this. Any further questions on this? Hmm. I think it kind of fits in with safety as well as probably way more efficient to have the stands than to worry about the chains and what we have there. Okay. Yes. And so freeze up and get caught and get caught. the next two projects um, within the capital plan, the replacement of fire engine and replacement of self-contained breathing apparatus, 
are part of multi-year projects. So these, um, we had done work in 2022 and the work continues into 2023. We need to buy the second half of the fire engine. And then we, it was a multi-year initiative to do the self-contained breathing apparatus. So this is continuing that, that multi-year commitment. Questions on that? And again, it is unfortunate that something as important as fire and safety equipment is so expensive that municipalities like ourselves have to spread it over multiple years to be able to pay for it. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Councillor Lewis. Do we know what the cost if we were to buy a fire truck this year, like what the full cost would be? No, we don't have a fire engine um, considered in the budget, so I wouldn't have costing for this year. Um, uh, Okay. It would be interesting to see what that would be in this environment. So the next uh, project is um, a land purchase for uh, the Genesee gravel property. So that is uh, $2 million and that was approved by council earlier this year. Any questions on that? And I mm -hmm. believe, Councillor Scobie, did you ask? yesterday we're not developing this in 2022 we'll start the development in 2023 i believe that was you had asked that question yesterday councilor scobie 2024 madam 2024 Chair. right sorry i forget what year i'm in because of the budget years welcome to that problem <laughs> <laughs> all right so oh, sorry. a little question on that mm -hmm. that property I happened to be down there one day and on the sign there's an orphan well on there does that have any effect on us or just it's another well that we don't get taxes on. Just another well we don't get taxes on. <laughs> do so when we go to develop that, if that's in the way, do we end up having to pay for uh clear, getting that thing out of the way and abandoned down low enough that it's not going to be our problem? Well, that'd be something we'd have to look at who's the last owner on it and and what what okay. negotiation we'd have to do with the province. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. All right. So um I'm just going to speak very broadly to the next four projects are for uh, fleet. So we have two utility light trucks as well as uh, two motor grader replacements. So I just want to speak to the work being done within the asset management committee and um, our asset management plan. So annual condition assessments are being done. We are doing a risk analysis on our, our fleet, which then informs um, the the fleet assets that we should replace first. So these four um, fleet vehicles are the units that were identified um, to be replaced through the work of that um, analysis. So I just wanted to speak to those four just in that way, just to say that it wasn't an individual department bringing forward a, a truck or a grader to be replaced. It was done as a committee looking at the fleet um, as a whole. So we have uh, two light duty trucks um, within utilities to be replaced. So those are two pieces that would be funded through utility reserve. Um, and then we also have two motor grader replacements and we are looking at um, a variety of funding to fund those two motor grader replacements. Councillor Smith. Let's talk electric vehicles. I was reading an article today that you can get, and again, not talking about public works, but if you need something, I can I see you can get a Chevy Volt. They'll pay 25% of the vehicle. So if you had somebody in an assessment and you were looking for a vehicle and we could move one of our trucks over somewhere else, it's just somebody else's money that we can potentially spend on electric vehicles. And they also have hybrids. Um, and again, I would... I'm not sure about the dependability of having somebody in public works. I'm sure they'll get back safely. But again, it is money on the table uh, for suitable vehicles that we could subsidize our costs and maybe move a half ton from one department into a more appropriate and give them that Chevy Bolt um, and put the sign on saying we're saving the world in one vehicle at a time. <laughs> so so there have been conversations. We do. Um, we had developed a fleet management strategy uh, in 2021 and have been working on some actions within administration on our that strategy. We are having those conversations about the change in, in the environment. And then also when you speak to doing a environmental social um, ESG, yeah. Yeah, uh, governance um, strategy, those are pieces that can tie in into that work. So it definitely is 
or these are the conversations that administrations is having. And I would agree that, you know, a vehicle like the work that we do to go out in the field with assessment vehicles would be, you know, a potentially a, a great fit to move in that direction. Currently, right now, we have um, vehicles that we had um, done a, a kind of lease to buy. And so now we actually own a few, uh, two vehicles that we use within the assessment department that have local low kilometers. So we don't have a need right now for a replacement um, for that type of vehicle, but it is something we are, we are looking at um, within administration. Um, just a question on our graders. We, we sell those at auction. Is that correct? Yes, we do. Okay. So we get the very best we can get for them. And generally I know that they're looked at quite um, highly regarded because they know the maintenance and stuff has been done. So we might even get more for our resale than what's anticipated there. Thank you. All right. So going um, to uh, project CP011, which is, is the NISCU West pump station upgrade construction. So this is a utilities project will be funded with some grant dollars and utilities reserve uh, for 1.45 million. Are there any questions on on that project. Is that, would that be grant money available as well for those kinds of water for life or whatever they're doing now or not? Potential? I'm, I, thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm just racking my head to know if that was one that we just okay. recently applied for okay. last week. This one is being partially funded by the MSI capital grant right. so as well. And yes. if it's appropriate, we will definitely apply for additional grants from that Alberta Water AWWC. Yeah. So we can that we can look into that further. We know that I know that you guys work hard to do that. And certainly when we look at something like a water supply coming out of NISCU, we know how important it is not only for our economic development, but for the people who also receive the water farther down the line. Go ahead. Do we owe money on this uh, station still, or is this one not debentured? You can check. We'll look into that. I don't know. Again, not exactly sure. sure if there's a debt on it or not. And if there is, it's just um, just of a point of interest that we're, again, life cycle goes through. The electric motor control center looks really expensive. I mean, uh, so, judging by the ages. Yeah, this is a 1974. Yeah, yeah. the ages. Facility, I was, so I'm, yeah, I'm 1974 or so. Like it's from 1974. And 1983. So there's yeah, two. Yeah, so there's, there's fairly really high risk here with the age right. of the infrastructure and, and what it services. So. so so if, yeah, given the construction years, I wouldn't expect that to be the case. So going to the next project, we have Sunnybrook uh, Wastewater Lagoon. Renewal con uh, construction phase one for eighty thousand dollars. Go ahead. Yeah, I see you have phase one. How many phases is there? Uh, would be one question, and then then a part of that would be the railway tracks along that lagoon. Are we going to be fencing that tracks off and the lagoon uh, fenced out, or is that coming in another phase, or is that not part of it? So um, on the project profile document, it speaks to having two phases to this project. Yeah. So in phase one, the scope of work would be the inlet, inlet control structure um, replaced with corrosion resistant structure, drainage improvements and site security improvements. So we can speak specifically this afternoon with our director of engineering and utilities around um, my understanding is the site security improvements would entail some of the fencing, um, but we can confirm that information this afternoon. Okay, thank you. The next project uh, is a folder inserter uh, piece of equipment for the finance department just to support those large mailouts um, and our tax notice mailout. Okay. The next yeah. one we have Royal Oaks Estates infrastructure deficiencies. Again, we started some of this work um, in 2022 to uh, look at rectifying some of the uh, deficiencies left by um, a developer that uh, defaulted on the development of Royal Oaks. So that work would continue in 2023. Councillor Smith. 
Again, part of the reason why that other $250,000 drainage project could be um, could maybe be put off. I do support this $180,000, which we have had presented to us and what we're doing in this as part of the developer not going through and the county doing it. So to spend the $180,000 here is the right thing to do. To sit back again, just for further support of maybe moving that $247,000 drainage out, we need to justify to our residents why we're putting stuff in, why we're taking it out. I can easily justify this is going in. There's other needs for upgrades. And the other was just, you know, with the cost of dollars going into that region. Uh, again, just another, please don't, let's not do the $247,000 drainage on top of this. Okay, and again, the bulk of that cost is actually asphalt, which I'm sure is needed in there. So, okay. All right, so the next project is the 15th Avenue Storm Paul Outfall Replacement um, and some engineering work to be done there for $30,000. Um, and again, I would assume we either don't have the expertise in house or there is this is some kind of specialty engineering uh, yes. that we could not do it in house. Go ahead. Smith. Can you ask Des to be ready to answer a question if we can use that to hold um, stormwater before we release it to the um, sewage plant? And I know they've asked municipalities to do it. So just a question, can this then be used for stormwater storage uh, to, I guess, um, level out flows to the sewage plant? Thank you. Okay, thank you. So um, I will just go over bridge and road because we will go um, on to some specific detailed sheets for those two programs. So the next one is the Jubilee Park day use improvements. So there's um, some different work that's being proposed uh, by Parks and Recreation um, at Jubilee. Are there any questions on that specific project? No. Okay. So turning over the page to the next um, project, we have signage implementation. So again, this is just the, the work of um, actually implementing some of the brand standards and signage standards that have been established with council in 2022. Um, and so it has been proposed to do um, some primary gateway signs and NISCU, NISCU business park entryway signs. And the locations are, are listed within the project profile document. Okay, right. We decided just to do those main high visibility ones and then look at a plan for implementing across the county. That's correct. Okay, any other questions on that? Oh, oh Councillor Smith. I am totally in support of this. However, I just wanna put a question to the table. We have a lot of big items to spend, and I think this is really good as part of our strategy. I'm wondering, do we do it over two years where Highway 2 is done first? And that's our big bang signs along the highway. And then I know there's some apprehension on council to move forward, but I also do support the Nisku Business Park. And I'm just wondering, are we hurting our brand presence? Are we hurting our identification and our strat economic strategy by dividing it into two years, doing Highway 2 first and the other? Just a, just a question that Council may want to look at spreading over the two years going forward. I, I guess I would ask a question to administration. Um, is there... Are, are there, is there some efficiencies because we're doing as many signs as we are, as opposed to coming back again? I mean, part of, as we move into this, I believe, which is going to be a, a time of economic growth, having a sign, especially at 41st Avenue, so people don't know, so people understand that's not the city of Edmonton, which we still get confused at. Um, I mean, maybe not so much on 625 coming, you know, cause that's, that's a little bit, I don't know. Um, I, I think it's important. I was, I, it took a lot of convincing for me to say, go ahead with these. But as I think about then the investment we're doing in economic and investment ready, if we don't, if people don't know where we are, then we've actually shot ourselves in the foot for all the money we're putting in that. So I think this is probably for me, the least we can do. It, it's not a, it's only, you know, $250,000 and I'm not being um, churlish by saying that it's it's but I think it will help us move ahead with that economic 
push that we're trying to do. I have Glenn and then you again, Rick. Yeah, um, a while back, actually, Rick had brought it up and, and I agreed that maybe we should be going down into the airport, and putting some signage in there. Is this this important signage? Is, is the airport included in this? Like, uh, welcome to Lidu County or you're out of Lidu County, something to that effect. Sorry. Um, so this is speaking about a uh, replacement of where we currently have some signs. So no, it is not including a potential addition of of something on airport lands um, okay. to say that you are now in Ladue County. Go ahead, Rick. And again, I know we have a discussion coming up today in camera where the potential for signage may occur. I, I agree right. with Councillor Balazs that it would be nice to leave the airport where it only says welcome to Edmonton, where maybe there's something on a road, maybe not this year, but something coming down is, you know, you're welcome to Ladue County there. And I, and I agree with the mayor. This is extremely important and everybody is doing this. Uh, Highway 2, I don't know what the traffic is, but we have free advertising for throwing a sign out and it will be noticed. And I agree on 41st Avenue, that's probably a super high priority coming out of the city of Edmonton and looking at everything happening. So again, whatever council, I support the full amount or a, a reduction amount, if that's okay. Thank you, Rick. Uh, Council Lewis? Thank you. If you turn the page over on your, your, you can see the options that we were given mm -hmm. uh, in your other, in your smaller binder. Yeah. But we have narrowed this down to the major important intersections that that identify the county for people that that would notice them uh, for investment purposes, and I would be comfortable uh, with this amount on these locations. Mm -hmm. And I would also say that currently the other signs we have on 39 coming out of Brazo or on Highway 2 coming out of Wetaskiwin County are are more than efficient for now. It, it states that you've changed counties. People know that, but as we get closer to where we're actually trying to highlight, it's important to uh, do a little bit of an uh, investment. Thank you. And the expectation would be at this point, so if our focus is for these signs uh, in 2023, now if something damages our signs, Correct. the standard is changed. Correct. And we have established this new standard that um, if something needs to be replaced, this is how we will uh, replace it. So I think... Um, again, Councillor Lewis had mentioned, you know, we have a high signage is very expensive and we have a lot of signage in the municipality. So um, this is a very, you know, small um, amount of inventory, but high impact uh, for us for the reasons you mentioned, Mayor, around economic development. So. And thankfully, the rest of our signs are pretty far off the road. So to be damaged, you'd have to be aiming for them. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Scobie? I agree on this, that these are important signs, but I think if we get to the bottom line of this budget yeah. and uh, have to cut something. something needs to be cut, yeah. I would like to have this one close to the bottom yeah. of the so line, close to the line. Because uh, if we do it this year, do it next year. Uh, Agreed. Isn't going to be a big deal, but you know, if, if we've got to do some cutting at the very end here to get to where we want to be, I, I would like to see this project as one of them. Okay. Thank you. So the next uh, project is um, East Water Transmission Line um, for design. So this is a project that we are using offsite levy dollars to fund for two hundred fifty thousand. Councillor Smith, what area are we moving service into then, specifically the uh, building the capacity? So here. Uh, so this first year provide the design of the water transmission line from the Nisku East pump station to the East residential lands. So the construction of the transmission line will be conducted in the subsequent year. Uh, the project, the projected size of the line is 500 millimeters with an approximate length of 2.5 kilometers. So then um, this work is full design, right of way and land requirements um, and feasibility of twinning East pump station header to allow redundancy should one of the transmission lines fall outside the pump station okay, or just, fail. Um, fall. Just to follow up. And so that is for our residential areas. Just do we have the capacity in the new area or is, do you see that coming on um, online, the re requirement to run extra water into our North industrial park uh, yeah. on the East side of the spine road? So in the business case, it speaks specifically about residential lands east of NISQ experiencing continued growth. And um, so it's really focused 
the on that that piece. So um, yeah. to Des this afternoon is whether we'll be seeing a capacity issue um, up into the business park with the uh, looks like just ongoing development. And we certainly want to ensure that we are right sized and um, ready for business. Okay. All right, the next project um, is a light duty sand spreader and snow plow. So a, a piece of equipment um, similar to what we've purchased in so the past. So Ms. Tomasco, this talks about Hamlets, but I assume it would serve our urban growth node as well, our Diamond Estates and Lucas Estates? Or Mr. Well, this this one, they speak specifically to, to utilize the this piece of equipment at waste transfer stations, hamlets, country residential, um, and Nisky Business Park. So they don't speak specifically about the East Vistas. Mr. Coleman? It's these, this type of equipment is more suited for country residential versus urban densities and so hamlets. Are we prepared for urban densities? Do we um, have, are we working on it? That's one of the packages that's in your, <laughs> yeah. in your request. <clears throat> All right. Johnny? Go ahead. Yeah, on that one, like, uh, is is this not two pieces of equipment, sand spreader and snow plow? You don't. So it would be, um, yes, I think it's it's two pieces. You have a sand spreader and a snow plow, so one on the front and one on the back. Okay. Yeah. That's what I was wondering how you were incorporating a sand spreader into a snow plow. Yeah. And drop it down and... No, I think it is two distinct pieces. All right, and then the uh, last project on this list is um, urban servicing. So speaking to um, servicing of the East Vista's residential kind of urban style development, we have three pieces of equipment um, that we've put together just to really demonstrate um, as we move towards um, these urban nodes that the type of equipment and the needs to service that area is different. And so these three pieces of equipment um, are well suited to do the work in those areas. What are we currently using, Ms. Klamosko? Again, is it possible to purchase one piece this year and one piece next year? I mean, I guess you can't have the snowblower without some place to blow the snow. I get that part. But we're, we must be currently managing somehow now. And I guess I get that this is planning for that growth that we're expecting. So just... Just that kind of thought, um, and I'll, I will speak actually in favor of the snowblower. The town of Kelmar has a snowblower like this, and they they clean right down to the pavement on the main streets. It is it is a great place, one of the best places to drive in the winter because of their use of these two pieces of equipment. But we must be doing something now in those areas. So go ahead, Mr. So Coleman. Currently with the snowblower, we bake, borrow, and steal when we can from oh. our urban neighbors, which they have the same issues at Correct. the same when time it's heavy you do. Snow. So okay. it's it's uh, it's a challenge to get it. And then the tandem axle truck, the real issue we're running into is everybody's hiring trucks at the same time to remove snow. Correct. And so okay. we're sitting waiting days. Like to everyone get. else. Okay. So nope. really the, we need the equipment. Good, good description. And certainly when it snows here, it's snowing in Leduc or wherever yeah. else we're going. Did you have a, I'll go to ask. Uh, that was pretty much what Ray. Dwayne just answered here. But I, because... I think when you start into the snow blowing, uh, you know, you get the snow blower and you start moving snow, one truck isn't uh, really going to be sufficient to, so that's what I was looking at, you know, is a person better to have somebody or truckers that'll uh, throw snowboards on and uh, haul snow for us rather than trying to own a fleet that is going to just have a snow blower and an operator and a tractor, everything out there and uh, have one truck hauling, it's going to be a pretty inefficient uh uh, operations. So I just kind of wondered if a person couldn't have somebody, uh, somewhere truckers, contractors ready to, to haul snow if I would well, sooner a, see that than buy trucks and then find drivers for them and stuff. Okay. Okay. That's a, that's a good comment. We can get some clarification on one. You're right. One truck isn't going to be sufficient. So what's our plan for additional trucks? Councillor Lewis and then Councillor Smith. Thank you. Uh, two questions. Where is our snow dump pile or their location if it's in that area? And then would we have to hire someone for this position of, or I guess it would be two people or those 
covered off with current employees. Yeah, we have a couple things. Uh, so our snow dump is over just to the north of here as uh, where we pile snow. There is no snow dump in the immediate vicinity of, of uh, Royal Oaks. Uh, we are contemplating a couple additional positions in the budget uh, for the public works area, the road operations area, uh, which will help uh, not necessarily those positions for these vehicles, but will help support that urban demand. Okay. Just looking at the tandem axle gravel truck, uh, would that be uh, incorporated with the need for one on a bigger, like a newer truck into going into some of the deeper areas of the county? And you're looking at um, an extra truck, which could be used probably in the vistas because it's not going to be putting on a lot of miles. So do you know when Des or his department may need another truck for the larger county coverage, which would be a perfect time to buy that uh, gravel truck and then surplus the one back into how many days a year would you be over there? Maybe 30 days a year taking snow out and it's just a truck that can sit in the yard, be used for the urban servicing and the new truck could go out um, into the broader, I guess, service area. So I, I don't have that answer in terms of, of the plans for the, the other replacements. Um, so we can... Yep, get that. Kind of gather up these questions and get some answers. From and I just want to follow up. I do support, um, I know the need for the gravel truck, but if Des has a gravel truck a year out, maybe it's a time to buy that truck for the field and then plan the surplus truck coming in to, to do local service. And again, just, you know, if Des comes back next year and says, I need the 250 for the truck, can, can we actually incorporate it with this uh, ask? I guess my other question is, is this stuff available for 2023 or is it farther out than that? Well, I think, I mean, that's another consideration <laughs> I was going to bring up. So a couple of things. One, it's anticipated we're going to bring online next year 300 additional residential lots in that area. So yep. that's a big impact. Plus the delay that we're seeing in terms of ordering to getting equipment. Um, you know, if we don't go to tender early in 2023 you won't be seeing equipment until 2024 already right you know right. you're okay so got it yeah, yeah so some of that timing becomes difficult because we just are seeing kind of these unprecedented type of delays in actually receipt of equipment so um so we need to be more proactive in terms of budget approvals to actually right. place orders on on equipment um, will this only be used in those areas or can it be also used like on the main street and yes. risk user? I, not, yes. Because we really don't have enough to justify just this. We need it for what we have. Yeah, no, none of our equipment is sits and waits, sits and waits or is, I, you know, earmarked for one specific location. No. Uh, we'll use it wherever there's a benefit in the county okay. to use it. So, And I do understand we're all being trained to understand supply chain issues. I don't know why, but we are being trained that way. Councillor yeah. Belazer? Yeah, I was, I was just going to say, uh, are we just only uh, sellers at Richie's or could we maybe be buyers? Is there another other counties that maybe are getting rid of something that's been well serviced or, or do we don't even look at that route? I, I mean, we're not desperate financially that we need to buy used equipment. I, I think we're better off to buy new equipment, life cycle it properly and not buy somebody else's potential problems. I mean, okay. you can have good experiences buying used. You can also have really bad experiences buying used. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. I Council guess just a comment. Ahead. How about our uh, plow trucks that are cycling out as we replace them? Is there enough life left in them to actually just be a snow hauling truck and Go maybe haul a little miles. dirt in the summertime and stuff? So I, I missed the type of truck, sorry. Our plow trucks that oh, are cycling out. We're, we've got a new plow truck coming. Uh, one is obviously going to go, uh, once you strip the sander and plow and whatever off it, you know, is there enough truck left there just to plan on hauling snow and a little bit of dirt work in the summertime? I mean, anecdotally, I've heard, I mean, some of the kind of corrosion and different pieces on some of the plow trucks, my understanding is when we replace them, they need to be replaced. However, I mean, I can, I can note that as a question and we can yep. follow up on that. Yeah. And again, I think as, count, as Mr. Coleman stated, most of our equipment is, used in multiple locations for multiple pieces. Um, so 
we'll look mm -hmm. and see if there's any efficiencies is what I'm hearing. Um, okay. This is a question uh, for Mr. Coleman, just before we move off this. One of the questions I continue to get from our regional mayors is that when uh, the county is divesting ourselves of some equipment, be it a grader or a truck or whatever else, they're always interested in it. Do we inform them when we're sending to auction at all? Or do we have a process for that? Because I know we, we don't want to be selling individually, but we could be letting them know what's going to auction and when. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what our process is okay. there, but we can definitely make sure we Thank do you. that. Um, I mean, the other option is, you, you know, we can also sell directly to them yep. if there's value. No, there, and there was, because again, for a town like Kelmar, uh, a, a grader will last a much longer time when it's not doing however many thousand kilometers we expect on ours, even if it's used. Okay, thank you. Just, uh, we'll set that aside on a, but it was a question I had from regional mayors. Okay. Okay. All right. So um, if we're, we have no further questions there, I would move to the next page, which is, the detailed listing of the 2023 road program. So similar projects um, to what was uh, discussed with council, I guess, on multiple occasions through public works committee meetings, as well as a specific uh, budget meeting that we had uh, in November. So all of the projects um, at the top are funded and the funding source is listed. There is the one project that's noted at the bottom, which is Range Road 275 Buford, which is an unfunded project that was included in the program earlier this year. So kind of going through the various sections, um, we have our major roads. So we have the design engineering, which is a typical thing we have in the budget every year. And then we have Township Road 510 uh, project for an upgrade there. How much of that will be recovered through offsite levies? Do we have any idea or is it offsite levy recoverable? That project is offsite lev levy recoverable. So um, yes, we can recover our cost. And, and that is a reason why we are proposing debenture borrowing on that specific project um, is because of that consideration. Again, it is in our area where we're looking at economic development happening. Um, we know it's a heavily used commuter road. Um, it's not really a business road, but it's a commuter road. Uh, I, I shuddered at the debenture, uh, but had talked offline to county manager um, and am okay with the debenture, uh, knowing that we can do the, for two reasons, knowing that we can recover some through offsite levies, but secondly, understanding how important, again, it is for that economic development um, and investment readiness that we're trying to portray. Go ahead, Councillor Smith. And the county manager started the budget saying this is an investment budget. Um, debentures are always hard, but I always try to put back that does council need to pay for that project today or can our grandchildren pitch in 20 years from now to finish up the project it's going to be well used it is a key to our development in that area i had again talked to um to des about the benefits of going through and just what it might look like the bridge of course being four laned in there and one of the things des talked about was even this new rink and ho alleged hotel and the off-ramp that uh, would get us into those business parks and again talking with the county manager about some of the projects on the books to the east um, in that area. I think I think if we don't do it this year, we could be like the city of Edmonton where we try to chase infrastructure after the development is in. And I think we've shown the success by having infrastructure. We build it and they will come and I'll just go back to the uh, to 41st Avenue four laning and the intersection that went there. And I think that really kick-started that whole area for us. So I shutter at the money but i also i'm okay with somebody paying for part of that 20 years down the road not me today and i think the the other benefit in the design that was completed that what we're doing here is the creation of the two lane of the four lane design so you're not having throwaway costs of just doing some rehabilitation on the existing structure we're going to do this realignment that then when the demand is there to do of the four lane um, in this area, we already will have the two lanes constructed with the right alignment so that we're not tearing up work to redo something else. Go ahead. Just a follow up. You asked Des if uh, he can answer these questions this afternoon. 
is it intersection 245? And what are the plans? Because we just approved four new residential subdivisions down that road, and that road will feed into the 510. So just wondering what upgrades would be included. Would there be lights there now? Uh, is it a controlled intersection? Will they be turning lanes on it? And just um, an add-on, because of course, looking at the 510, it's easy to see what we need to do, but with, uh, there's already pressure on our, I believe it's 245 at that intersection. So just uh, Des, if you can give us an, up, an idea of what uh, what will occur there next year. Okay, yes. Councilor Lewis. Thank you. Uh, I would fully support this uh, this road to be upgraded at the traffic volume uh, that we have on file is over 8,000 vehicles a day. Uh, from a pure safety aspect, um, I, I believe that this is one of the major important and we're pushing people to, to develop in this area. We have residents that want to be there and, and there is a lot of them. So I think to get ahead of the game uh, is vitally important. Okay. Yep. We'll approve it with sadness. <laughs> yeah. Yes, big numbers. Okay, so it going, is big numbers. Yeah. Yes, rural roads, um, we have uh, Township Road 502, Township Road 481, Last Link Program, and the Rural Road Initiative um, are considered in the budget. Go ahead. Um, do we need, should we consider adding an extra $500,000 into the rural road initiative? I know it's a pressure point budget, but I'm just wondering, does that keep the great successes that you continue to report and we continue to see on our roads? Um, and can we drop back down to a million and sufficiently build? Or is there a need for a discussion of adding 500 extra thousand um, during these budget? Just the rural roads initiatives, it's down to a million, right? Yeah, we've re reduced it for down to a million for 2023. Um, I, I mean, I, I'm i comfortable taking a year with a little less, but I wouldn't propose that in future years. I think that million and a half dollar investment or even slightly more uh, going forward, there's more shoulder pulls that we need to do. Uh, and it's an ongoing program. Uh, I would like to see us start looking at money towards uh, advanced brushing and drainage. Uh, those are things that make a big difference yeah. along with the shoulder poles and the gravel work we're doing to really improve our roads. Um, my complaints go from hundreds in a year to two on the roads. So we are doing the right thing. We are those poles that used to be down the road and are no longer there. So again, if you're, if you're confident and you see a longer range and you don't need the extra money from council this year because you see the program being successful, I'm okay with that. But if you wanted council to discuss an extra half million, I'm okay with that as well. Go ahead, uh, Councilor Scobie. I guess I, when I first saw that, I kind of said, no way. I pushed to get that up to the million and a half here a couple of years ago uh, and feel that we need that. But Garrett made the comment uh, here the other day that uh, he's confident that we're moving along quite well with this rural road initiative and that and when I see we're planning on budgeting the million and a half again next year, uh, that's the difference. I would support this uh, cutting it back for one year, but uh, you know, I definitely want to see it back up uh, for 2024 to the million and a half. And uh, we need to be putting everything into it and more if necessary to, uh, we've done some great leaps of fixing our roads, but there's still a lot of work to do. Yeah, and I, I agree uh, with those comments. Certainly um, worked hard my first term to get any money put into gravel roads. Um, but the confidence from Mr. Broadbent about, nope, we can do this. We're going to, we'll do what needs to be done and move ahead. Um, I'm like uh, Councillor Scobie, understand the importance, but we can do one year with a little bit less. Okay, so the next section is subdivisions. We have Lakeshore Drive and uh, United Street, Mission Beach, and then Gilwood Beach projects. Okay, I, I've got some questions on this. I, originally, I asked you a while back, I think that number was 1.3, and I, I see you've got it down to one now, but um, during our conversations with the task when County the last while, when we had a joint meeting, they had stated how South Wizard Lake Road was such a good road. It, it turned out really well. Can we not do something like that in these subdivisions, like change the downgrading of what we're going to do in there as far as uh, sure. type of, of road work? 
and then maybe expand it out into, say, Mitchell Beach and Moonlight Bay and use the same amount of money to do more work? Could we pose that to Des? So I, I know on this project, um, you know, the, the work that's being anticipated is spot repairs and then placing chip seal or microsurface product well, um, on it says these cold mix. A rehab one and yeah. repair on the other. Yeah. Because yeah. we have... Um, well, I, think it's, two chips I, in, yeah. I think it's fine to ask that question. Yeah. I know that there is, yeah. I, and I'm going to say requirement with air quotes to return it to the type of uh, surface there was before. I mean, there that is what yeah. we try and do in our subdivisions. Um, I don't know what the surface of the road is. The thing with South Wizard Lake that made it so good with the reclamite and the millings was that it had been just built. So right. it had a good road surface to begin with. I don't know what this is like. So there's a lot of questions, I think, around yes. this. And, and, and I'm the same. I, I'm glad to see now it's moved up from unfunded to reserves, but I'm still thinking there's possibly a way to save a little bit of money. And the reason I'm questioning this, in, in I don't know if it's a year, two or five, or maybe more away, but sooner or later, there's going to be a septic system coming around there. And I don't want to be spending a bunch of money making a really nice road that we may have to rip up. Now, that may be years away, so... It, it, it's just this is this is kind of where I'm thinking. So just one thing I just want to highlight. So the existing surface is that pavement cold mix, but right. the proposed surface is to do the chip seal um, on that. So I just okay. want to clarify um, that piece. Yeah. Um, and again, I do believe it has to do with the base of mm -hmm. the road. But I, I'm, I'm sure we can get somebody to comment on it from either engineering or road operations yeah, we or even more, Mr. Coleman. Yeah, we can yeah, get more detail from engineering, but it, yeah. it, it really is about just repairing, yeah. spot fixing what's there, putting coal mix back in, and then putting this chip seal over it. Uh, we're not contemplating rebuilding the road. We've had the same thought yeah. or, or discussion around long term at some point. There's probably going to be some pressure uh, from that area to look at water and sewer lines and and that will require probably just obliterating those roads and then rebuilding them at some point so um we're okay. not looking at a major well like, all, all i can sit here and say is i'm glad you're doing something because these folks have been on my back since i sat here nine years ago yeah. and now we're at least going to do something they'll be happy with that i'm sure yeah this will give them a reasonable driving surface yeah that's <laughs> i'm sure that's what well they yeah. we know that they want would want more but th th that'll be fine thanks mm -hmm. Thank well, you. What I see on here, uh, they're saying that like the subgrade, uh, it says in the business case, the road subgrade is in good condition. So it's a matter of putting a surface on that's going to save, save that condition. subgrade, uh, keep the road in good shape. So well, if they, they just need to put a smoother okay. finish on it. So then the next final section is NISCU. So we have uh, NISCU spine road design. So that's a cost share project with the city of Leduc for that um, airport road to 65th Avenue. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. um, there had been an anticipation that 65th Avenue would have been started this year. Is the city of Leduc still interested in doing this work at this time, despite the fact that they had not, they have not started yet on their overpass or whatever their intersection is there? My understanding is, yes, they okay, would be. Good. Thank you. And I do think also it allows that shovel-ready um, yep. potential opportunity. So the next one is the Nisky Spine Road and 41st Avenue intersection, the left turn bay design and construction. So just seeing some um, yep. concerns at that intersection, so expanding on that turning lane. I'm starting to wonder if we should just put a traffic circle at every intersection and then we don't have to go back and put in lights and then take out lights and then put in a just kidding I don't mean that if anybody's watching it's just a joke <laughs> so if there's are there any I'm just going to the next page but um turning over the page yeah, just wanted to highlight um that note one one thing that we really wanted to highlight uh to council and to the public around the investments we make on our roads through our operating budget. So what we've done here is just highlighted the various components that exist within um, the operating budget and road maintenance, um, road operations department. So that's an investment of $4.8 million with all of the yes. different pieces of work there. So just, again, just another significant investment that council supports um, for our road network. 
So thank if, you for highlighting that. No. So then if there's no further questions on roads, then I would turn to the bridge program. So fairly consistent funding we've been providing to the bridge program uh, around that $1.8 million. So we have the, the listing of the various uh, bridge files that are proposed um, for 2023. And this is a consistent list to what council has seen on a few different occasions. Any questions on the bridge program? And I know we have gone through them either in workshop or public works, I can't remember, but I think we've seen them at least two times, maybe three. Yes, I think it, yeah, it's been a couple of public works committee meetings yep. as well as one budget specific workshop. All right. Just remind me, we do have, bridges are inspected by the government as well, not just ourselves. Correct? By the government of Alberta, yep. we there's a, a kind of a more regimented process. Great, okay. All right, so just um, on kind of a final piece here within um, this tab there behind the blue sheet just has some grant summaries. So just a couple of quick highlight pieces I wanted to make on these uh, grant summaries. So the first one is the Municipal Sustainability Initiative for Capital. So just at the top here, it shows um, kind of how much we've been allocated and what we're utilizing. So we only... We're utilizing most of the, the funds there, um, just leaving around $17,000 on the table, which is allows a little bit of you know variation in uh, the project work. The one thing I just want to highlight, when you start to look at um, the second box below, when you look at the 2021-2022 allocation of 7.5 million, and now 2022-2023 is down to three. So I just wanted to highlight you know, that, that is going to be an impact for us um, on our capital program for sure. So I just want to highlight that piece. And then the second one, uh, it used to be called the Astax Fund. Now it's called Canada Community Building Fund. Um, same kind of thing. We're, you know, applying the funds that we've been allocated, leaving a little bit um, for variations within projects, 37,000. But then highlighting below in that third box, you go from an allocation in 2021, 2022 of 1. 1.6 million, um, went down to 825,000 in 2022, 2023, and then it goes down to 750,000. So again, you know, just a couple of bigger impacts with some reductions to the, that grant funding. I know that one of the things that we put on our advocacy list was, you know, that steady predictable funding um, certainly, this is a great indication about why it's needed. Um, at RMA, I heard our president of RMA talk about the fact that the pool was so small that when they looked at the funding, everybody got a little bit less and the pie just needs to be made bigger. So perhaps we need to continue with that as well. Go ahead. Are you anticipating um, just the single gas tax, former gas tax, or are the Liberals seem to be spending quite a bit of money. I'm just wondering, do you anticipate a doubling of it again this year? That would be um, very nice if that occurred, but I don't have any certainty around that funding. Okay. All right, so if there's no uh, further questions on those plans, um, then I would say we can move to item number four, which is a new initiative plan and it's an in-camera item. Okay, so just uh, prior to moving in camera, our next uh, actually four items on our agenda are in-camera items. Um, I don't imagine we will have finished those before lunch. So for those of you that are joining us, for those of you that are joining us, um, we probably will be in camera at least till lunch and maybe pass up just as uh, some information. So I need a motion to go in camera. Councillor Lewis, thank you very much. All in favor? Thank you. And we will.
Okay, thank you very much. I'm gonna call us back from um, recess and in camera, it's 1.29, uh, just to let people know, we went in camera prior to lunch. The only motion we made in camera at 12.20 was a motion to come out of camera. And so we are going to begin our afternoon, um, Wednesday afternoon uh, agenda. We will be starting with some questions that we have responses to and then moving directly into uh, public transit and fees and charges. So Ms. Colosco, is this to you? Yes, please. Thank you. So um, just to answer some questions that council have asked over uh, Monday and this this morning, I um, just have a couple of answers for you. So one question had been asked in terms of the printing of the resident guide. So we, when we completed the resident guide in 2022, we ordered um, 300 copies of the resident guide and we have 40 remaining. So that will bridge us nicely to the end of 2022. And then we're going to be able to make some edits to that resident guide um, with our new council member and then reprint early in 2023. Then the, we had probably five or six questions that um, our director of engineering and utilities will be able to provide answers for. So I'll turn it over to him to go through the questions that came out of Monday and this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Marigla. The uh, microphone on the, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, council. Oh, over the last few days of budget deliberation, there is a series of questions for engineering and utilities, and I'll do my best to provide answers to the questions that have arisen. Uh, the first one is Highway 625 Sparrow Drive uh, safety assessment. The question was is whether there's a capacity to do it in-house. Um, we do not have any safety experts on okay. staff. We So to do it in-house, it wouldn't necessarily provide the product that we really need. The other aspect that I want to submit for consideration is that if we do want to approach Alberta Transportation for some type of cost share for some type of improvements, having a third party stamp and their engineers and their professional stamps on the documents would go a long way to getting them to participate versus a municipally generated document. So. Thank you. That was my question. That was a good answer. Uh, the second one was Lucas Estates, and the, I guess the question was, is the, the need to do that. So since the original submission of that document and the original PPD, there has been some changes to the drainage pattern in, in uh, Diamond Estates, Lucas Estates, which does have some relevancy. Can I put something on an overhead? This first document shows uh, Lucas Estates and Diamond Estates. So off to the left or to the west um, on screen that I'm facing is Lucas Estates and Diamond Estates is off to the right. Uh, you'll see a cross-hatched area within Diamond Estates. Now, mm -hmm. this is an entire area that drains to the southern boundary of Diamond Estates, continues to the west till it hits basically the corner runs north roughly the, the midpoint and then drains into the cul-de-sac within Lucas Estates and then drains through the internal system within Lucas Estates and eventually exits to the adjacent range road. Um, one of the reasons that we needed to do some drainage improvements is to address the inconsistencies of elevation between the outlet of the ditch just before the cul-de-sac and as well as along the cul-de-sac due to a few culverts which are misaligned and it's much che cheaper to cut through the cul-de-sac and install a new culvert versus realigning the culverts within the road allowance because these are very expensive concrete driveways. Since then, as you know, we have a significant amount of development in this area. So this is essentially the same diagram, but there's actually two cross-hatched areas. So within Diamond State's area to the right, that area now drains into Churchill Meadows, which is immediately to the south. During the development of that uh, development, uh, we requested that the storm sewer be extended just to the northern boundary and pick up all the drainage on the eastern side of, it would be... 25th Avenue, 25th Avenue or Street Northeast. So what this has effectively done is probably reduced the amount of drainage that's going through Lucas Estates to a quarter of the previous volume. Um, with the amount, with the reduced volume, um, it does 
perhaps change the priority of this project. Thank you very much. I'm Any seeing no questions, questions on All your right. response. So did you have other ones or was that the two? No, that, uh, yo, I have some more. Okay. Uh, the next one is the Sunnybrook Lagoon project. Right. This is split into two phases. Uh, the first one is the project that we we're proposing for next year for $80,000. And the question was, was fencing included? Yes, it is. Um, underneath the, uh, the project summary, it says inlet control structure. Uh, needs to be replaced with a corrosion resistant structure, so a plastic um, PVC HDPE type uh, manhole instead of a traditional concrete manhole, which is susceptible to corrosion from uh, sewer gases, uh, drainage improvement, and site security improvements. That's municipal code for fencing. Okay. Uh, uh, Councillor Belazo, yes, if you could use your microphone. Thank sorry. you. Nope. Yeah, that was me that asked that question. Now, I was wondering, you talked about fencing. Now, is that just around the lagoon, or is that going to come right off 23 all the way up to the lagoon if it's them tracks off? Uh, the intent is that we put in some type of fence between the access road and the adjacent property to the south, because we have had complaints from that uh, resident. Um, we have not looked at fencing the uh, access road from the tracks themselves. Okay. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the fourth question was regarding 15th Avenue Storm Pond project. I'm just going to quickly bring that one up. So this involves the 15th Avenue Storm Pond at the end of 15th Avenue at the far east side of Nisku. The question was, can this be used for wastewater sewage? Um, Right now it acts as a storm pond. So it's a surge pond where the stormwater from Nisku Industrial Park enters the pond and is released at a controlled rate. If the pond is being used for some other use, um, it would need to be reconfigured to handle sewage. Um, obviously we don't want that draining to the Black Mud Creek. So we'd have to go and correct that. And at the same time, we would have to replace that pond with something else in order to uh, address the stormwater quantity issues to make sure that we are, do not exceed pre-development flow rates. If we decided to do that, just as an aside, that pond is a grandfather pond. It was designed for the one in 25 year storm. Current standards are for the one in 100 year storm, which would substantially increase the volume that would need to be retained. So um, my advice would be to keep it in its existing state. Okay. Uh, the fifth one was the East Vista's water line. This is a large diameter water main extending from the East Nisky Reservoir to the East Vistas. Uh, the questions were, were, is this necessary? Do we have water capacity issues within the East Vistas? Is this required for the East Vistas or for Nisky? This is required to support the development within the East Vistas as it sits right now. Um, there are no water quantity issues. However, moving forward, it's something that's going to become more and more of a concern. The most recent water modeling that we've had completed for this area has indicated that a 600 millimeter line will be required within the short term. So by allowing us to do the engineering this year, it would allow us to deliver the project next year. The last thing I'd It's still not on. Uh, sorry. In your report, you had called for a 500 mm um, pipe going in, and you just mentioned 600. So, is that going to be an upgrade from the intent of that original project? Oh, I might have misspoke. If it says 500 millimeter, that's what's going to be required at the end of the day when you're installing a new water line. The expensive part isn't the pipe itself, it's the cost to bury the pipe. So, um, the upgrade between a five and 600 may not necessarily be that much, but at the end of the day, um, what it says it's required uh, is what we will install, provided that the modeling supports that as well. We don't want to install uh, undersized line either. The, it, it's a big water line, yeah. The, where I had in my head is the previous uh, analysis that was done when the VISTAS was first being proposed. It was a 600 millimeter water line, but since then there's been other improvements which may have driven down the diameter that's required. And the one thing I do want to highlight, this is an off-site levy eligible project. So it doesn't necessarily mean that there's any tax dollars nor utility dollars that are going into this project. Okay. And then the last one is the new Sarepta Force Main. Uh, it's, we have identified a, an assessment in the long-term plan. Uh, when the 
assessment of the various utilities within New Sarepta was completed as part of the dissolution of the village, I guess, into the hamlet. This wasn't necessarily looked in detail. Um, since then, we've had a number of sewer breaks where the backfill that was used for this main perhaps wasn't the best material where you have rocks directly against the pipe and it's a relatively thin walled pipe. And this is what I guess what we know so far. And as you pressure up and pressure down the line when the pumps activate, there's a slight expansion or contraction of this line and rubbing against those rocks eventually creates issues where we have sewer bubbling up to the surface. And as Councillor Smith knows, there's been a, a few instances where we've had reports from landowners that there's sewage on the ground that we've had to, to deal with. So what this is proposed to do more detailed analysis of this main and determine if there's any alternative actions that could be undertaken, um, aligning or something of that nature, or does it need to be a full blown replacement? Okay. Yeah. That's why I yeah. Again, that was me that asked that one. I just, I, I'm not against the project by no means. I just thought when we were doing all this work over there that that was done and, and it just kind of was a shocking number in a few years from now. It is absolutely shocking number. You're absolutely correct. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you for those answers, Mr. Riglod. We'll move on to uh, tab 23, public transit, if we could. All right. All right. So I guess to date, you just go through the uh, service overviews because the, um, the engineering operational plan contains the relative transit elements. So I won't be able to go through the transit elements of the operational plan until you do the engineering plan. So I can go through the public transit budget yep. itself though. So the transit budget itself consists of three main components. You have the enhanced transit, the Leduc transit, and the Leduc county transit. So um, the enhanced transit, basically it supports enhanced transit to and from the airport lands in partnership with Edmonton International Airport, the city of Edmonton, and the city of Leduc. So are, there are two components for this. We have the, the general services contracted and purchases from other governments and agencies. So within the 2-200, which is general services contracted, uh, we have an increase in actual services to align with actuals. And the same with purchases from other governments and agencies, increase in contract services to align with actuals. These figures are both provided to us, once provided by the city of Edmonton for the 747 route, and that comes to us via the city of Leduc. And the second one is the airport on-site service, again, which is provided to us by the Edmonton International Airport based on the best information available and comes to us from the city of Leduc. And both of those initiatives would be cost shared with the city of Leduc and in case of 747 with the city of Edmonton as well. Any questions on uh, enhanced transit? All right. Uh, next one is Leduc Transit. Now, this is the transit service that's in place right now between the city of Leduc and Leduc County. Understanding that we have sent a letter to the city of Leduc indicating that uh, Leduc Transit may be coming to an end due to the city of Leduc joining the Regional Transit Services Commission. This is basically a uh, placeholder budget in order to cover off future transit service um, as our own transit service study is completed. So. Um, with that, we still have looked at what requirements would be necessary underneath the Leduc Transit budget based on the best information that is available from the City of Leduc. So based on existing, I guess, ridership, um, there's been a decrease in revenue to align with anticipated ridership. And this is, again, a number provided by the City of Leduc and an increase in bus pass revenue to align with actuals. Uh, within a 2200 series, so this is general services contract, there's been a minor decrease in insurance aligned with actuals. The 2300 series, which is a purchase from other governments and agencies, a decrease in contract expenses to operate Leduc Transit, again, reduced ridership, reduced operating expenses. And 2800, a minor increase to merchant and bank fees to align with actuals. As everybody knows, 
there's always increases to the different fees from credit cards and banks in order to gain access to their services. Mr. Marie Glaude, I heard, and I don't know if it's true or maybe you won't be able to answer it, that Leduc Transit is now 100% on demand, that there aren't any routes. Um, is, that, is that a fact? And would that account for all these decreases perhaps? Um, Leduc Transit still has a dedicated route. Okay. So. It still does. It has some on-demand service yes, and, it rest, and it has some. It's a mixture. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. Yep. Thank you. Councillor Smith. Some uh, clarifying questions. Leduc Transit, of course, which we are a partner in, uh, and I had read part of the regional transit going forward. Of course, Edmonton will be whether they fund it or not, whether it actually survives through their budget cycle. But a report said the Leduc Transit, 50% of their trips are in Tiniscu, yes. uh, which means, and, and so I had heard, and again, just asking for your knowledge or clarification, that Leduc Transit within the regional system has permission to continue to operate their local transit in Niskew in the city of Leduc. And I would assume, again, just throwing in that enhanced transit, would that then become part? If Leduc Transit was to, stay, to stand up and remain, is there a way that enhanced transit can become part of the airport agreement, part of Leduc Transit? And uh, again, because the cost of the enhanced at the airport is probably more than what we do with all of Leduc Transit. So Des, just what do you know on, on that going forward? What I can say is that the situation is very fluid right now. Um, we're having discussions both ourselves and City of Duke with the Regional Transit Commission to determine if there is a place for the uh, for Leduc Transit. Now, in the latest budget that was presented to the Regional Transit Services Commission, it was indicated that Leduc Transit could remain. However, what form of function might that uh, entail? And again, there's one partner that sits on the Regional Transit Commission, the other one doesn't. Still needs to be discussions between ourselves and the City of Leduc what that might look like. So unfortunately, I don't have a lot of information that I can say what it's going to look like in the future, other than that we're having active discussions and we, at the end of the day, we wanna make sure we provide best value to our residents and to our users with the transit system that's being provided. Mr. Merglod, what is the set day for that regional transit to, to actually take off? Because I thought that signaled the end of our uh, relationship with Leduc Transit. Yeah. Is that a, in stone yet? I have not heard an okay. in-stone date yet, right. no, but I understand it's supposed to be late, or sorry, early, early Q2. Q2, okay. Yeah, that's what I had heard as well as Q2. So. so early Q2, 2023, and then we'll work on, uh, which I see in your actually engineering plans, um, a modified program for ourselves. Exactly. Transit. Okay. Any other questions on the Leduc Transit component? Seeing none, move on to... Leduc Last County one Transit. is Leduc County Transit. Now, this is the joint position um, that we have. Um, sorry, this is the portion earnings benefit for the transit and project management position that we have in place right now. So this is the, the staff member. Okay. And you do a small increase related to charges and earnings and benefits. All right. Perfect. None. Um, Are there any questions on the blue sheets? Nope. Tab nine, page 19, fees and charges. All right. We'll all get there and there's no changes. Okay, there's no changes. Nope. <laughs> so it's the one, the page before the blue page. All right, so no proposed changes to fees or charges yeah. for transit. Go ahead. One other question. We voted against their smart pass or whatever, but I see a pass has now arrived yeah. with some of the others. The Leduc Transit uh, had engaged that being one of a partner. Does that mean we are assumed to be in that system now because we are part owners in Leduc Transit yeah. and we kind of rejected it. We didn't want to go there, but yeah. are we in it? Um, Leduc Transit does have the necessary equipment within their big buses and they do not have it within their smaller buses. They're waiting for handheld units in order to uh, read the ARC fare cards. They also do have a uh, point of sale and a capacity sell card. So Leduc Transit is part of the ARC fare system. Um, but as it sits right now, where Leduc Transit sits, we really can't say whether we're part of Leduc Transit or not. Thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Riglod. On to 
Uh, number nine, engineering, which is tab 16, please. All right. Um, so we'll start off with, uh, I guess, the operational plan. Not a lot of changes within the operational plan on the first few pages. Uh, things I do want to highlight is the addition of the transit component. Yep. So we do have two bullets underneath that. So managers will do county's transit system, provide effective transit services while meeting our users' needs and engages with other transit authorities to provide seamless transit service to our users. At the end of the day, if you have someone that's getting on a Ladue County bus, you wanna make sure that that experience is as good and as seamless as possible to the user. Within the organizational chart, in order to support this, you notice that there is a transit and project management engineer. Again, that is a new position that was discussed last year. Um, any questions before I move on to sections two, three? Any questions? Keep moving. All right. Um, section two. So we do have four goals within that section underneath supporting robust economy, explore methods uh, providing increased public transportation. Also underneath the robust economy, increase investment attraction. And lastly, underneath the same pillar, council pillar of the strategic plan, create efficient transportation infrastructure that meets community needs. And then goal four for strategic priorities, strong leadership, demonstrate leadership within regional initiatives and organizations. So our action plan goal one, explore methods providing increased public transportation. So establish and monitor new transit service. So this would be uh, what the work that's required to implement a transit service within Ladue County and its interface with the Edmonton Metropolitan Regional Transit Services Commission and as necessary ETS. So the metric for this, uh, for implementing a new transit service would be Q1 2023, having a transit service in place, which aligns very nicely with what we heard the stand update for the Regional Transit Service Commission is as well. Uh, goal two is investment attraction in conjunction with utilities, complete the work necessary to enable NISQ to be business ready for any potential new economic development uh, development opportunities. So this is something that was in last year's plan. Unfortunately, with the departure of our manager of utilities, that kind of moved things back a little bit and created some more work for myself and a manager of engineering. So this is something that we'll be completing in Q1 of 2023 and specifically focusing on third-party utilities, so natural gas, electricity, to determine the available capacity for servicing industry. Um, this will be a, the metric for success on this would be a secondary report to follow the overarching municipal utility study, which looks at the private third-party utilities and determine where the advantages, disadvantages, opportunities, and threats would be for utility services within NISCU. Um, and surrounding areas to make sure that we are business ready. Within goal three, create an efficient transportation infrastructure that meets community needs. The big project this year is complete the construction of Township Road 510. So there are two actions underneath this, the completion of the construction of Township Road 510. So this would be the, the contract award. And then the second deliverable for this in Q, sorry, the contract award would be Q1 2023. Our intent is to get that contract signed as soon as possible in 2023. And then in Q3 2023, completion of Township Road 510 Roadworks and Irvine Creek Bridge. So this uh, consists of constructing two new lanes as well as a new bridge um, over the Irvine Creek. And again, if there's any questions at all as yep. I go through, please feel free to go ahead, Council let, us. let me know. Thank you, Des. If uh, if 510 is is uh, approved in budget, when is construction slated to start? It would start as soon as possible. So utility relocations normally can occur just about any time during the year. So we'd be starting out that work as soon as possible. Um, sometimes the bridge work is better to be done when the creek's frozen versus when it's mm -hmm. active. So it's either done fairly early or very late. So we try to get those elements out as quickly as possible, take advantage of things like fish windows and that sort of thing. And completion date expected? It would be the probably October 31st of 2023. Okay, the intent great. is to have the project complete next year. Awesome, thank you. Go ahead, Ms. Kamasko. So, so there was a question this morning on the intersection um, of Township Road 510 oh, and Range Road 245, which I um, was just going to pose to Mr. Mirglod around what potential intersection upgrades would be occurring um, for this project okay. there. Yeah. 
So for the Ranger 245 Township Road 510 intersection, we are looking at installing the necessary uh, turn base that would be necessary to support the, the traffic that's expected to use this intersection. The initial analysis from our consultant has indicated that traffic signals are not warranted at this time. However, it does not necessarily mean that would not be warranted at some time in the future. Okay, thank you. Um, if there's no other questions, I'll move into 3.2. Um, develop and implement gravel road reconstruction maintenance programs from data using the real road study. So this is the rural road network condition rating that we do every year. So we monitor and report on this on an annual basis. So in Q3 2023, we would have the completion of all the rural road inspections. And in Q4, we would then represent a report to council indicating whether uh, the overall road network rating has improved decreased or generally remain the same based on the improvements and the investments by the municipality in that calendar year. Um, okay. Underneath strategy 3.3, develop and implement a surface road maintenance and rehabilitation program. Um, first action underneath that, we monitor and report on pavement network condition rating. This is the same thing that we do very similar to the rural road network where we inspect every single mile or kilometer, I guess if you metric size of our roadway network come up with a condition rating for each roadway segment, and then we use this to generate our annual road program based on actual need and how that section of roadway is performing. So really what we want to see is a year-over-year -year improvement on the pavement network rating and a report provided to Public Works Committee by Q3 of 2023. Uh, we'd also implement and update the five-year pavement preservation plan. This would be basically approved by council and presented to public works committee, as well as going through the budget process by Q4, 2023. We review that program well in advance with council. So there's a firm understanding of the methodology, what the program looks like and making sure that we can answer any questions that may arise. And then lastly, evaluate Reclamite as a service and rehabilitation alternative. So we do have a couple more re uh, Reclamite services. We're actually planning on chip sealing one this next year. So we wanna make sure that this is a good product and making sure that we have a good firm understanding of where this tool could be applied. Again, it's like I've always said, you have a toolbox of different techniques that you can do use to address roadway condition issues, whether it be a soft surface or some type of surfacing. This is just another tool in the toolbox that will become available for us to use. And then strategy 3.4, this is a carryover from 2022 as well as complete the transportation master plan. Council has received a preliminary report from our consultant. Um, from that, we do understood that we perhaps missed the mark. So we are working on this to come up with a, another version of the report that perhaps is more in tune with what council's needs and desires are and achieving what the municipality needs as well. So that is scheduled for Q1 2023. The intent was to have it complete for Q4 of this year. Um, but as I said, with the departure of the manager of utilities, that's created some additional work in the senior leadership within the engineering group. So um, that is something that's been move to the side a little bit. So it's still an important project. We still want to complete it, but we want to make sure that what we present to council aligns with council's vision as well. Okay. And then lastly, goal four, um, demonstrate leadership in regional initiatives and organizations. So this will be continued participation in the EMRB's working groups and collaboratives. So there's two collaboratives that we're working with right now. First one is a solid waste collaborative and the second one is stormwater collaborative. And in both cases, uh, determine potential for really collaboration you know, on solid waste and recycling management for the solid waste component. And on stormwater collaborative, any opportunities for regional collaboration in regards to storm water management. So, Councillor Smith? Yes, I do appreciate your time in the regional initi initiatives and organizationals here. I'm just going to ask a question on participating in the storm water collaboration, being a rural municipality we generally would use the natural flows of uh, creeks going in and I believe everything in this area probably most areas flow into the North Saskatchewan River what are the benefits for a rural municipality to work with the city on stormwater management when Edmonton what does Edmonton want to do back the creeks up yeah. and run them into the county or um from the rural aspect the 
advantages to the municipality, probably a little bit more hard to define, but having ourselves a seat at the table also ensures that we're able to steer some policy direction when discussion occurs. For instance, when you're talking about stormwater quality, it starts talking about things like uh, maybe uh, fecal coliforms from uh, feedlots, it could talk about pesticide use, it could talk about fertilizer use. By having a seat on the table, it makes sure that the agricultural community is represented at these tables and making sure that uh, a boogeyman isn't made where a boogeyman doesn't exist. Um, the other aspect is that we also do have a fairly significant development node with NISCU and the East Vistas that drains into Irvine Creek, Blackwood Creek, and eventually enters into the city of Edmonton. So we also have a vested interest to make sure that any kind of stormwater management requirements are in line with other municipalities while also being in tune with what Alberta environment requires. So again, we are business ready and not putting on any development under undue hardship that our municipal neighbors aren't. Okay. Any other questions on that? Seeing none. All right, so moving into the, the budget document itself, um, underneath leadership and administration. Again, we've tried to keep this um, as much a, um, a continuation of the work that we've done. We've been doing good work for the municipality. I'd like to think we've been delivering projects on time, on budget, and we'd like to continue on with that. So um, there are some minor increases. So within uh, 2100, this is underneath the leadership and administration budget and underneath earnings and benefits. Uh, there is an increase of 84,975 to this increase related to changes in earnings and benefits. Underneath the 2200 series, there's a 10,000 increase in professional development as conferences are expected to be held in person. Uh, last number of years with COVID, the attendance in conferences has dwindled and we need to make sure that we have skilled up-to-date personnel. So attendance in conferences, courses and things that like make sure that we have staff that can keep, have necessary training to maintain their best professional designation, but also are up-to-date in the latest techniques and products that are available. If I may, um, just to clarify, the 200 series isn't just conferences. The engineering department isn't spending $167,000 just on conferences. You're absolutely <laughs> incorrect. I, I, I did have to go to the ledger sheet to take a look. Yes. It also includes engineering fees and consulting fees and a whole plethora of other things. So we're glad to know you're not spending that much money on conferences. I'm certain I can find a nice conference in Greece or Italy or something like that, but okay. I don't think I get the benefit that um, I really would Smith need. Smith has a question. There's just a clarification. You have an increase 2% from Fortis. When we switched over on their program to LED lighting, did we not sign an agreement and lock in an electrical rate for 20-ish years or something? Or there was where no are we at with the increases? Yeah. This is something that was passed on to us by Fortis, so basically a letter saying that they expect a 2% two increase, two increase in all street lights. So uh, that's been reflected in this budget. Um, I do remember conversation on uh, reduced increases or no increases, but there was nothing signed that said there would not be any increases for the foreseeable future. Okay, yep. So I guess that the Councillor Smith uh, handles the last increase underneath 2,500, which is a 80, roughly an $8,500 increase. And this sort of affects a 2% increase passed on to us by Fortis in the cost of street lighting. Any questions before I move on to the bridge program? Nope. All right, moving under the, the bridge program. So this is the, the program that looks after the entire bridge inventory within the municipality. So there's 185 bridges, which is 114 culverts and 71 standard bridges. So we are asking for a $30,000 increase for, this is an emergency bridge repairs due to increased number of bridges requiring repair. Uh, this year, what we ended up doing is we took money from other line items in order to address uh, bridge repairs. So this way it still enables us to remain solvent as far as engineering budget, but we've had to move money around to do so. Okay. 
Within the next um, service level overview, this is a road data collection. So this is the essentially the traffic counts that we, we do. And there's a decrease, I'm pleased to say $4,000. This is decreasing cost due to reduction use of contracted video counters. So we do have an array of counters that we use in doing traffic counts. We have the traditional tube counters, which are very cost effective for us to, to use, but they do have limitations, not good to use during the winter because the first snowplow goes and scoops those up. Um, we also have a radar counter now, which is basically a non-contact counter that we can go and attach to a nearby fence post or a power post or sign, which basically uses radar to collect things like traffic volume, speed counts, things of that nature. And lastly, we do have a camera mounted unit that we can place on intersection that does do intersection counts. Now, the problem with this is that we take the recorded video, we send it off to the company where they do the necessary video analysis and there's a fee associated with that. Mm -hmm. The last number of years, we've been using less than the S and depending more on the other types of counters. So as such, this is more right-sizing the budget based on our actual need. And again, you're often questioned by council for traffic counts. So being able to do this and have the data we need to make the decisions is critically important. And then lastly, the servicing program. So this is uh, providing engineering consultation and support with the county's annual road program. So this is project management, material testing and minor design work. Uh, this remains stagnant at $60,000, uh, same as 2022. So even with the cost escalations that we've been seeing in industry, um, we're satisfied with the value that we have. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions at all in the blue sheets? Any questions on those? I am seeing no hands up. Um, tab nine, fees and charges, engineering. Do we have any changes before? Oh, yes, we do. Oh, wait a minute. I have a question. Yep. Oh, um, there, there was just an additional question that was asked this morning that I'm, I would like to pose to our director sure. um, to answer for council. So on the road program for 2023 for the subdivisions for Lakeshore Drive, at Mission Beach and Gilwood Beach. Yes. There had been a question asked about perhaps doing a different type of treatment on um, those subdivision roads to allow potentially for additional work to be done yes. in that area. So wondering if you would have an answer at this time to that question. Yeah. Um, originally when we put together the PPD, we were looking at using some type of surfacing treatment like a, a microsurfacing. Uh, since then, we've had some other engineering groups take a look at those roadways um, and provide and determine if the recommendations of administration were accurate. Again, this is a fairly densely populated area. There's a lot of residences, um, a lot of traffic, a lot of visibility. So we want to make sure the work that we do is appropriate. And at the same time, there is some uncertainty about uh, future utilities that may be required in that area. So putting in a hot mix asphalt surface may not necessarily be the best solution. Understanding that what's happening with utilities is something that still needs to be examined. And unfortunately, it's going to be a 2024 project with the utilities master plan. So um, we're looking at some type of solution that would provide a good level of service to the residents. Um, while at the same time making sure that we are doing what's appropriate for the road network. So what we're looking at right now is rather than putting in a microservicing recommendation was to do a, a chip seal and then likely some type of oil sealant on top of that. So you have that good hard black surface on, on top. So that's what we're looking at right now. It also enables us to get more work done um, out in the area, potentially for the same or less money. Okay. Yeah, just <clears throat> Tony. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, again, that was me. Probably knew that. Um, I was just wondering because uh, I thought maybe uh, I've had chats with the residents at Mitchell Beach and you're going to be right there. So I thought if we could cut back on one, that would give us a little more extension on the other. Yeah. But it appears like not. You know, we, <clears throat> again, with the budget valley that we had, um, we're trying to get as much work done now, if we can get more work done for the same value, if the full budget value has been put in place. And again, if the project makes sense based on us being in uh, the local area, this is a, the tough thing with the workout at Pigeon Lake is it's a fairly isolated area. So you want to try to do as much as you can at the same time. So at the same time, you don't want to do a project where you haven't got full value out of the surface that's in place. So, okay. Okay. Thanks. 
Okay, thank you for that. Um, page five of 19, fees and charges, engineering. Uh, I see we have some changes in there. If you yes. just want to highlight those, please, Mr. So the approach installation, uh, the, the, there's a resolution a number of years ago where the county didn't necessarily do approach installation. So this just basically fulfills that. Um, so it removes approach installation and widening of approaches to, to eight meters. So um, any type of time that the road operations group would look at doing this work as well as capacity allows. And as you can expect with addition of additional miles of roadway, additional miles of pavement, additional developments in North Nisku and the East Vistas, the time that's available becomes much more shorter. So we don't want to start providing service that we really have no capability of providing. So, And then the other changes is that frequently we get requested by the petrochemical industry or uh, third-party utilities that they need this done quickly. Um, have no problem providing an enhanced service, but there should be a cost for the, the fast pass lane. So what we're doing with this is that if you do want to have a, an approval within five business days, there is a premium associated with that. Otherwise, the typical approval would be within 10 business days. Oh. I think it's fair to have that option in there. If you need it done quicker, we can do that for you, but it will cost a bit more. Yeah. So any questions on the changes to fees and charges for engineering? I am seeing none. Let's hop over to tab 26, which is utilities. All right. And whenever you're ready, Mr. Mariglod. All right, we'll move into the utilities operational plan. Now, essentially this hasn't, changed at all from last year. So water, wastewater, waste management, recycling, stormwater management, and the contracted services that we provide over at Edmonton International Airport. Um, the organizational chart itself uh, really hasn't changed at all from what was presented before. Um, and something I do wanna highlight is uh, I have made a conscious effort to try to reduce the, I guess the thickness and the number of actions that we've trying to undertake next year. Um, understanding that the manager utilities position, which again is a, as it's come to known, is a fairly vital position. Having a new person who's integrated into the organization and say, by the way, here's a laundry list of things that you also have to do in conjunction with learning your job is not necessarily fair to that individual. So um, we're trying to focus more on the existing services that we provide versus looking down the, the road. We've done a lot of work this year and trying to be future ready. So this is a year where um, we can perhaps catch up a little bit on some of the other things that have been outstanding. So, okay. so underneath strategic priorities, um, we have two. So first strategic priority for robust economy, increased investment and traction. And the second one is goal two, also underneath the robust economy, build economic resilience. We also have a goal underneath uh, section three, which is departmental goals, improve Ladue County solid waste and recycling services. Last year, we've completed the solid waste strategic plan. Uh, seems like forever ago, but this is a overarching document that we want to make sure that we fulfill the action plan that fell out of that. That's something that council requested and we have timelines associated with each one. So it's important that wire is not directly captured underneath the council strategic document. It's something that the municipality and the department believes that we need to highlight as part of our operational plan. So. Underneath action plan, goal one, increased investment and traction. Strategy 1.1 is in conjunction with engineering, complete the work and able to be business ready. So this is the completion of the water and wastewater studies. Um, largely complete in place. However, we did have to expand the scope um, to align with some of the work that the revitalization study that Jordan's group is right. doing. They needed some additional data for them to do that work. So in discussions with them, we had to increase the scope to take a look at the existing wastewater systems within NISCU and do the necessary modeling. So while that was outside the scope of the original work that we're doing, it's still gonna be very valuable information where we can identify where there's restrictions in the overall system as well. And it also provides them the necessary information to do their work. So then we have, Jordan has a planning side, we have an engineering right. side. So as a whole, we're able to provide council with the overarching work that needs to be in place to make sure that we can revitalize, rebuild NISCU as necessary, but also making sure that we have the capacity for any new developments that may arise. 
So within this determine potential limitations for water and wastewater capacity within this use to so complete the analysis available in water and wastewater capacity within this use. So at the end of the day, we're going to have two fully functional water and wastewater models, as well as identifying any of the limitations that need to be um, addressed. Um, based on the water and wastewater capacity analysis, develop a prioritized action plan and funding plan to address these limitations. So once you have the study complete, it will identify where we might have some bottlenecks in the system. The next step is to say, okay, now that we understand where these bottlenecks are, what's the priority? What's the cost? How do we address them? And what's the priority in order to uh, address these? So we have a prioritized action and funding plan to address the water and wastewater capacity limitations within NISQ. So um, any questions on that before I move into goal two? No. Uh, so goal two is build economic resilience. So implement wildland metals, wastewater treatment system, local improvement plan. So the local improvement plan has been presented to council. The operating agreement has been provided to council. We have all the necessary legal reviews and uh, engineering calculations for these documents. So the next step is the director of planning development, myself need to meet with the residents of wildland metals to go through the operations agreement. Um, once that's been accepted by the group, I will be coming back to council with local improvement plans for adoption. And then once that's been adopted by council, we introduce those to the residents of local, uh, the residents of wildland meadows as well. So the action is to construct the wildland metals wastewater treatment system and the deliverables to actually have construction of the same system. So can I ask a clarifying question? When I read this, Mr. Mariglad, I read it as the county and your department are building it. Yes, we will. We are building it. We would be building it and it would be funded by the residents of, of Wildland Metals. This is why it's being installed as a local improvement. So there'd be local improvement tax assessed to the residents okay. yep, of Wildland yep, I Metals. That. I was just, I'm talking about the actual Oh, the actual construction. Uh, we would hire, it isn't like county force would be actually constructed. Correct. We'd That's... hire the necessary, <laughs> okay. uh, we, we'd be hiring the okay, folks. Okay, so we're it. going to manage the construction of Wildland Metals. Correct, yes. Because I was thinking, how where are we getting the people to do this and how does it yes. fit into road maintenance? So we're actually managing or overseeing the construction. Correct. It would be okay, that's good. contracted I, out. I was Sorry kind of, for the clarification. I couldn't see you out in the back hole, so I okay. wonder. In your fancy suit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you for that. And, uh, strategy 2.2, continue to support communal water and wastewater systems. So support community initiatives for small scale water, wastewater treatment and servicing options for higher density areas. So continue to advocate for residents of Vantage Point and Highline subdivisions to connect their wastewater collection systems to the Luma Lagoon. As you know, we have put in a request to receive grant yep. funding for this project and um, we're waiting for an update from um, the province on that project. Strategy 2.3, continue to support uh, communal water and wastewater systems. Uh, I have to apologize. That's actually an error on my part. Yep. It's not support communal water and wastewater systems. It's uh, the wastewater, uh, stormwater system. So this storm is water. Okay. So we'll determining what's required uh, for stormwater. So this is complete the gap analysis on stormwater management systems. So analysis of any shortfall in stormwater conveyance, treatment, maintenance, and management responsibilities. Again, this is a carryover from 2022 as well. Um, this is something that the manager of utility was stick handling as well. And with him leaving the organization, um, it's to prioritize this work as well. And this is more of a forward, for, a forward facing piece where we want to take a look at the existing stormwater systems. What work do we need to do to be in compliance with our licenses? What work are we doing now? Identifying the gap and the necessary funding and then having discussions with council on what the funding gap looks like and potential funding methods to address that. Does this, would this include, this gap analysis include on what cleanouts might look like in, in different basins where stormwater, um, where it's being released, like the Black Mud Creek and places like that? Um, we haven't necessarily went down to that level of detail. I'm more looking at the stormwater management facilities themselves versus okay. the, the, the creek that discharges right. to, However, that's a, a great consideration that we should be looking at that because um, well, if the storm ponds aren't necessarily being properly maintained, that siltation could end right. up in the Blackwood Creek. And if I may, it fits a little bit to Councillor Smith's question about how does this fit at the regional uh, table? Yes. When we started to talk about stormwater, um, certainly the rurals were left out. I reminded them that the water actually discharges into rural municipalities and there is a cost in a management of our 
of our creeks and tributaries into the North Saskatchewan River. So it is a very important piece um, and we need to be mindful as we grow about what those release rates are so that we're not flooding out some poor farmer down the way. Absolutely, it's making sure that yeah. the capacity to receiving a water course is also examined, not necessarily yeah. pre-development flow rates. Absolutely, thank you. Um, moving into goal three, improve Leduc County solid waste and recycling services. So the actions that are contained underneath this strategy um, enact the recommendations of the strategic waste management plan. So there, with the strategic waste management plan, there was an action plan, and these are actions that were flagged for 2023. So the first one is examine the impact of a three ton cap implemented at the Leduc and District Regional Waste Management Facility. It's something that we've done, and now it's important that we have an understanding of um, what the impact was and how successful that was. Uh, Q2 2023, investigate cost and feasibility of implementing scan card system or other technology for transfer station access cards. Um, right now we do issue cards every two years. And now we're wondering, is there uh, perhaps a forward facing or future facing technology that could be implemented that could do the same thing? And then lastly, investigate cost resource implications, feasibility of expanding agricultural plastic recycling services. So we do have twine recycling right now at a couple of our transfer stations. So twine bags are available for pickup by our resident farmers. So is there a potential where we could expand this program to other things like grain bags, things of that nature? Okay. Nope, that unfortunately requires right. specialized equipment which mm -hmm. a municipality doesn't have, but it might be available for lease or rent. Yeah. And again, you did speak about the uh, solid waste uh, strategic plan we did. What's nice is that all the councillors are still the same. You know the work that went into that and understand what our long-term view is. And it's great to see that we're using that to actually guide further steps. So um, on to your next section. All right. So moving into the action. Oh, if you may. Sorry. Yep. When you're talking to the grain bags and stuff, I understand, you know, like the loose ones are a problem. We'd need rollers, but there are farmers out there that have the bag rollers mm -hmm. that, that roll them and put them in a good roll. Uh, is there a possibility of getting starting to handle them if they're brought in already properly rolled, uh, you know, versus them just bringing a whole truck box full of crumple, you know, folded up plastic? Yeah. But there are guys that they roll it there as they empty the bag, it rolls it up into a nice tight roll, and uh, you know, it could be brought in tied and uh, and they could dispose of it that way. Uh, we wouldn't need any equipment for that, yeah. Um, it's something that we have not envisioned as part of our, our current phase of the agricultural plastics, but we can definitely have a conversation to see if that's something that could be added. We just have to make sure we manage expectations appropriately that it's we don't necessarily supply the equipment, but if someone does have it and it's properly rolled up, that we may be willing to take it. But we have to see if that can fit within the existing agreement that we've signed with Lean Farms. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. So further than that, I have a little bit of knowledge about the grain bag situation through Alberta Care. Now, this is being in, in other municipalities is being picked up by a big semi-trailer truck. So on site would have to be a, a loader because this truck will not come for two or three or 10 pieces. They want the trailer filled. Mm -hmm. So uh, and, and they're picking this up at, at no cost. So um, there's no money in this mm -hmm. for us to be made. Right. So we would have to store all this and have a place for storage or store it away. But um, so I can see it happening. But like Ray says, some of the bag rollers do roll us up. But there's also a mobile unit mm -hmm. that is made and was put together a number of years ago for, I think, twenty three thousand dollars. But it was rented to farmers to do on site rolling of these bags. And once there was enough on site added together it was all brought together and then shipped yes so, so we'd have to determine this parts of the the feasibility is one thing to accept the bags themselves but if you're looking at providing equipment things of that nature that becomes a much more expensive endeavor and a much more in-depth versus um what might be might maybe let me try that again what might be entailed if we just start taking green bags at the transfer station so this is where we'd have to determine logistics as well as what's contained underneath the agreement with clean farms. Okay. All right, on to waste management. So we'll start off with leadership and administration. Uh, service overview really has not changed from what was presented before. 
And there's a, a series of adjustments here at the budget. So I'll start off with uh, 1,500. So this is a, other revenue from own sources, uh, a minor adjustment of $900. So that's uh, an increase, uh, sorry, um, $900 um, increase. Sorry, I just wanna make sure I steer you correct because, no decrease, decrease, sorry. The brackets always get me. You have to apologize for that. <laughs> Um, that's why I'm an engineer, not an accountant. So, um, two 100 earnings and benefits. So increase related to changes in earnings and benefits. So this is $9,467, uh, two dash 200. This is general services contracted, uh, total, uh, decrease is $16,504. So this is a 20 K decrease in consulting to support a one-time project, but then some increases, minor adjustments to phone and insurance to align with actual. So give a little and take a little there. Underneath two, 300, this is purchased from other governments. Um, increase resulting in change how the district landfill bills municipalities for industrial, commercial and organic waste. Um, there's been a change in some of the management over at the landfill. So things that were maybe previously charged as um, cover material, um, now rightfully is being charged as waste material or organics or something of that nature. So we're being billed honestly properly than we were before. Before we were receiving a little bit of a deal, but now uh, we're being treated the same as everybody else. Well, it's a significant increase. It is. I mean, it it's is almost significant. double what it was the yes. year prior. And it's mostly in organics. Before they okay. were car charging us organics as cover material. When it's not cover material, it's something that's being okay. sent off for processing. And that was a decision that they made. It wasn't something that was done at our request, but now they've changed it. It's where we're being treated the same as okay. every other municipality. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and lastly, two five hundred goods, supplies, and materials purchase. So a seven thousand dollar increase for highway signage to transfer stations. This is something that fell out of the, uh, the the strategic plan is to have some signage on the highway. There's actually specific transfer station signs that say Royal View Transfer Station two K this way. Um, it also enables uh, new residents to easily find our transfer stations from the highways as well. So, and then a minor adjustment to trials and supplies to align with actuals. So that's a total increase of $5,775 when you have the take some, give some sort of scenario. Any questions on the leadership and uh, administration before I move into the curbside pickup one? I'm seeing right. no hands. All right, curbside pickup. So this is a curbside pickup that we provide within Nisku Hamlet, New Sarepta, Diamond Estates, Lucas Estates, and the Royal Oaks subdivisions. Currently, we provide pickup for 326 residences. So there is an increase underneath the 1,400, which is the sales and goods and services to individuals. This is an increase of uh, $8,260 to account for growth within the East of Vistas. Um, within a 2,100 series, this is earnings and benefits. This is a decrease of $1,100 to, this is related to changes in earnings and benefits. Underneath the 2200 series, this is general services contracted. We do have an increased account for growth within the East Vistas. This is a cost of $3,382. And lastly, underneath reserve transfers and grants, this is 2-700. Uh, we do have an increase of $6,060. This increase in transfers to reserves to account for growth in the customer base. As you know, we do have a small amount that we set aside each year to act as a rate stabilization reserve. Councillor Lewis. Thank you, Des. On your summary, your, your waste management summary budget, you have a 0% uh, percent and nothing budgeted for curbside pickup, but then this, this, this uh, service overview would say differently. Is that because it's um, is it because user it's pay? user pay? It is a user pay system, absolutely. This is self-contained, so money in and money out. There's no tax dollars that go into this. So. Okay, and do we collect an admin fee for any of that, or is that straight in and out? Uh, no, there's an admin fee over and above that, if I remember correctly, as well as reserve transfer to act as a stabilization. Mr. Marigolod, moving into 2023, we know we're expecting um, significant growth in our urban growth node. Um, our ability to adjust to, let's say, another 200 houses by the end of next year, is we're able to do that? 
Yeah, because there's money that comes in and money that goes out. So the so fee that's being charged pays for that. And within the contracts that we do have, has a capability of expanding that customer base. And, I, as well. and again, I was more worried about the contractor yes. being able to manage, uh, you know, almost a doubling in his in his work. But yep. you're saying yes. Yes, yeah, we have a very large contractor. Okay. Um, I believe it's GFL, and they oh, provide okay. yeah. services to everybody. All right. Thank you for that. If there's no other questions on curbside, I'll move on to transfer stations. So this covers off Deluma, Mission Beach, New Strap, the Royal View, Sunnybrook, Thorsby, Warburg, and Wizard Lake transfer stations. So there are some adjustments in this budget as well, and I'll just perhaps provide you a summary of the changes. So underneath the 1500 series, which is other revenue from our own sources, uh, total change of $192 to align with actuals. Underneath the 2200 series, this is general services contracted. We do have a 36K increase in blue bag processing transportation costs aligned with our actual volumes and minor increases to repairs and maintenance for buildings, equipment, grounds to align with actuals. Again, we want to make sure that these transfer stations stay in this uh, good repair. Underneath the 2300 series, this is purchases from other governments and agencies. Um, we do have a decrease of $10,646. This is a decrease in volumes of building with debris to align with actuals. So um, less building materials coming into site, likely being halted at the regional landfill. So that means that's less that we need to haul. And then lastly, 2500. This is good supplies, materials, sorry, good supplies and materials purchased. Um, there is an increase of $1,754. This is a minor adjustments to propane costs align with actuals. Every transfer station does have a, a small yep. hut there that's heated by propane. So as everybody understands, the price of propane has been going up regularly. We like to call them little houses. Little houses. Little houses. Tiny homes. Tiny They're homes, tiny there homes. you go. Very <laughs> tiny homes. Okay, um, on to fees and charges. So if you go to tab 10 and just flip back, it's where the fees and charges are for utilities. All right. And we have some changes. I'm... Oh, my mistake, I am looking in the wrong set. I should be looking at utilities fees and charges. It's behind the blue. There we go. Oh, no, that's not the. You got it. Um, maybe. No. Well, probably Natasha does. She does. <laughs> um. So for solid waste, I have no changes in any of the fees. Nothing's right on mine. Okay. So there are changes in the wastewater one, which is the page before. But if you're on page five of seven of the utilities. Fees and charges, there no changes are reflected. So these are the only changes, the wastewater overstrength. And that's underneath the utilities budget. For the solid waste budget, there's no changes in okay. service charges. Okay. All right. Where are we next? 27? Yes, tab that 27. is correct. Tab 27 on to wastewater Water collection. All right. So this budget uh, document you have in front of you is again a little bit different than the, the others, but I'm not necessarily going to go through it in verbatim, but I do want to highlight a few things. So um, first thing is that we did complete an upgrade to the NISQ sewage transfer station. Um, this is uh, upgraded in 2021 to provide better spill control, effluent pretreatment, and site circulation. So now this is a, a fully automated system that can provide 24 hour access if necessary. Currently, we provide wastewater services to 339 residences in New Sarepta and a Greater NISQ, and 747 businesses in NISQ Industrial Business Park. Uh, 96 Hamlet residences also use our lagoon for sewage disposal. Um, and then the last thing I do want to highlight in the first section bef before we move into some of the highlights is our EIA contract. Uh, we do have the contract to manage and operate the utility services on Edmonton International Airport. Um, 
it's a three-year contract commencing in mid-2021. So we're about halfway through the contract with Edmonton International Airport for that service. Um, highlights for 2023, Duke County customer wastewater sales for 2023 are expected to increase approximately uh, 1, 3, sorry, 132,700 cubic meters from previous year's budget. This is a projected increase in a NISQ industrial business park. The 2023 sales for new Sarepta and the NISQ transfer station are expected to remain at 2022 levels. And the 2023 sales at Edmonton International Airport are expected to increase by 16,400 cubic meters from the previous year's budget. So that's the, the volume projection. So we're projecting growth in NISQ and the East Vistas, but not necessarily anything within New Sarepta at the transfer station either. So okay. for the rate that we charge, the 2023 water budget reflects a seven cent increase from the Alberta Capital Region Wastewater Commission and a 13 cent rate increase for infrastructure renewal and replacement. This is something that was envisioned as part of the original rate review that we completed. So in 2023, we'll use the information that we've put together for um, future rate projections. And it also a three cent increase in operational costs. The total rate will increase by 23 cents based on the previous factors. There's also projected to be a 0.79, sorry, 79 cent monthly service charge increase to the base meter. So this would be a 5 eighths meter. Uh, up to a $19.82 increase for the largest meter in inventory, which is a four inch meter. So the revenues collected will provide funding for the following changes in expenditures. So we have consultant introduction of 22 and a half thousand to address issues requiring consulting services. This has been reallocated from the engineering budget. Uh, repairs and maintenance an increase of 22,750 to focus on preventative maintenance and equipment rentals, increase of $40,000 for interceptor cleaning, which will save over $25,000 per year in overstrength charges for industry sewage transfer station. So this is the interceptor that we have at the sewage transfer station that collects all the grit and everything before it enters the, the commission system. So uh, good supplies and materials for electricity. We have an increase of $1,000 to better align with the projected actuals. As mentioned, the seven cents rate increase from the commission. And we also are projecting a rate contribution, or sorry, rate contribution, a reserve contribution of 587,433 for future infrastructure renewal and replacements. Um, I just want to speak a little bit on this. Having this reserve in place is why we not may not require today, we might not require tomorrow. Money that we have in a bank account and continue to build that up enables us to do the necessary replacements and renewals as they arise in the future. Um, it's something that's, again, I can't speak enough about that we have this sort of money set aside so we can have the necessary money in place to pay for future replacements. Um, maybe I'll pause there before I move into rate structure if there's any questions. No, and again, uh, council has worked on how we do rates, understand the process, um, how they're set, what goes into it. Um, and that's thanks to the work from uh, your department as well, Mr. Marie Gladso and Ms. Weiss. I know you guys work together on that. Absolutely. They keep me on the straight and narrow and make sure that we, uh, I don't spend like a sailor. So <laughs> um, rate structure to address long-term financial viability of county utilities, a comprehensive utility rate study was completed in 2018 and revisited this year. Utility rate structure includes the following. Um, the wastewater utility will continue to operate as a single financial utility. Uh, service charge based on the size of the customer's water meter will fund fixed operating expenses and uniform rate. So this is basically a per cubic meter charge will cover any variable operating expenses. From 2018 to 2026, uh, 13 cents annual uniform rate increase to fund uh, was put in place to fund future capital replacement and renewals. So within the table below, it does show what the difference is from 2022, 2023, based on the various meter sizes. Um, also shows what the difference in the uniform rate is. And based on some sample usages that we usually see for that meter size, what the total difference is and the percentage increase, as well as highlighting what the commission component is of that rate increase. Okay. Um, 
last thing, as part of the rate review and something that we continue to do, which I believe is uh, something that's unique in the capital region, if not Alberta, is affordability. So based on a 5 eighths meter and a 15 cubic meter water usage, the average household will see a $4.22 per month increase for wastewater charges. Average monthly wastewater charges equate to 1.1% of the average household income, 1.6% of average household disposal income, and 3.25 hours at minimum wage. Um, according to AWWA, water and wastewater utilities should be between 1% to 2% of a monthly income. So we want to make sure that we fit within that bracket, that we're not overcharging for our utilities or becoming unaffordable. So at 1.1, uh, we're firmly within that 1% to 2% threshold. Okay. Are there any questions on that before I move on no, to uh, any questions on the blue sheets? I guess it'd be the next step if there's no questions on what's been presented so far. No, not so far. So on to tab 28, which is water distribution. All right. Something near and dear to Councillor Smith's heart. <laughs> <laughs> so we provide water services to 536 residences in New Sarepta and surrounding Nisku area and 758 businesses within Nisku Industrial Business Park. Um, again, want to highlight the same thing is that we also look after the water and wastewater utilities at Edmonton International Airport. So for the 2023 highlights, uh, the Duke County customer water sales for 2023 are projected to be 121,700 cubic meters more than 2022. The projected sales are increase of 124,400 within NISCU and minor decreases with the new Strapter saying about 500 cubic meters of, uh, and bulk water of 2,200 cubic meters. Um, no aid increases are expected from the Capital Region Southwest Water Services Commission, which is great news. We've also included 17% per cubic meter rate increase uh, for infrastructure renewal and replacement. This ends up netting out to a decrease in 34 cents in the monthly service charge for the base meter and an $8.57 decrease in the largest meter inventory for the fixed charges. So the revenues collected uh, through the rates will fund a $12,600 rate increase or increase to fund an increase in annual valve maintenance program and preventive maintenance. Uh, also increase of $5,000 to better align with the naturals for natural gas and electricity. As you can expect, natural gas and electrical costs are going up. And a reserve contribution of 8,300, 8,000, try it again, $838,405 for future infrastructure renewal and replacements. Um, again, before I move into rate structure, I'll pause here and see if there's any questions. No questions on water okay. so far. Moving on to rate structure. To address the long-term financial viability of the utilities, we did do the utility rate study uh, in 2018 and revisited in 2022. And basically everything remains the same as a sewer utility. Operate as a single financial utility, a service charge based on a customer meter funds a fixed operating cost and a uniform rate, which is a consumption based per cubic meter charge, operate covers the variable operating expenses and future infrastructure replacement and renewal. So really what we're looking at is a 17 cents annual uniform rate increase to fund future replacement and renewals. And the table below shows the changes in the different meter sizes between 22 and 2023 in the service charges. And in the uniform rate, what the total impact is per cost per month and a percentage increase and what percentage of that is commission increase, which happens to be zero for all meter classes. Are there any questions before I move into the household affordability? All right. So based on a 5 eighths meter, uh, base meter size and 15 cubic meter of water usage, the average household will see a $2.19 uh, $2 per month increase for water charges. The average monthly water charges equates to 1.6% of their average household income. 2.3% of the average, average household disposal income or 4.6 hours at minimum wage. So understanding we're looking at one and 2%, we're still within that one to 2% uh, component of monthly income. Okay. Um, with that, if there's no questions on that and no questions on the blue sheets, what I'll move into next is that there's a couple sheets I do want to hand out here. 
which unfortunately should have been included as part of budget package, but it was an oversight on my part. I didn't notice it. Uh, the first one is combined water and wastewater. Um, at the end of the day, actually, Renee, can I keep one of those? Um, we've done the affordability, I'll try that again. We did do the affordability calculation for individually for water and wastewater. The next thing that we need to do is, okay, but no one really just has water. Nobody just really has wastewater. So what's the combined impact? So as a percentage of disposable income, water and wastewater would cost the average residents 3.9%. That's the 3.9% of their disposable income. Hours of minimum wage is seven hour, 7.8 hours. And based on monthly income, we're at 1.3%. So we still at sit between the one to 2% of monthly income when you took a look at the, the cost. So from an affordability calculation, um, we're still in good shape. The last document that's been distributed is where do we sit in our comparators? We want to be competitive within the region. So it's important that we have a good understanding of where we sit with utilities. Now, understanding that the Duke County is fairly unique where we're trying or and we're being very effective at keeping all the costs of the utility within the utility. Um, some of the urban municipalities Everybody within the boundary receives utility services, so they don't necessarily have the same sort of restrictions in many cases. So what you have in front of you is a table which basically looks at the 2022 mill rate and looks at the, um, I know it says 2022 water and sewer, but this is actually 2023 water and sewer that says, uh, a mistake on our part. That's. But you got 2022 mill rate, but 2023 rates for us. Yes. So, um, regardless, this is the, sorry. So, this is the 2022 rates. So, this combines mill rate, water, wastewater, storm, waste, and monthly taxes, and the total estimated cost. So, really, what we're trying to do here is show where do we sit. Um, in the region uh, when you're looking at the suite of services that a municipality provides their residents. So looking at Ladue County um, for the 20 meter cubed, five eighths meter and a quarter million dollar home, um, we are the lowest in the region. So that would be the, uh, maybe I'll back this up. So there's a series of tables here. Um, each one has different comparators. So for instance, uh, the first one is a 20 cubic meter consumption, five eighths meter, and a quarter million dollar home looks at the water, wastewater, storm, waste, monthly taxes, and gives you a total monthly combined cost. So this is a total, total funding that the municipality requires to provide services to that resident. The next table over is a 50 meter cubed consumption, three quarter inch meter, and a half a million dollar home. So we want to have some comparators of where we sit. Um, underneath that, we also look at commercial monthly costs as well. So 20 meters cubed, five eighths meter, two and a half million dollar commercial property, 50 meters cubed, three quarter inch meter, seven and a half million dollar property. And then the last two comparators are 200 meters cubed, one inch meter and a $10 million property. And the last one is half a million cubes a year, sorry, half uh, 500 cubes a year two inch meter and a 12 and a half million dollar property. So what this is, this is again, all 2022 values looks at, because you don't have values for other municipalities in all fairness, because they're going through their budget process as well. Um, so we will try to update this early in the new year once everything's been solidified, shows where we sit relative to our neighbors in overall competitiveness for cost of services provided to the business or residents. Appreciate that. Certainly keeps us, shows us that <clears throat> decisions made at this table keep us um, competitive in the region. Go ahead, Councilor Lewis. Thank you. When your chart talks about monthly taxes, is that for the residents or because I would I would like those tax rates for my properties if that's what the tax rates are? It's the mill rate is what it is. The so mill that, rate. Okay. That's, yeah. Okay. Okay. Councilor Smith. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> 
Oh, it's finished. Oh, there it is. Thanks for staying within the affordable uh, water rates. And again, we have some warnings that there should be some increases coming from the commissions on water and you still have room in there to continue to make it affordable, even if they were to um, forward and pass down some of the construction costs and capital projects they have. So again, it's reasonably low, but there's ability to move up without really harming our residents at this point as well. Thanks for that work on that. Thank you. Okay, fees and charges. Tab nine behind the blue sheet. All right. So the fees and charges that you see in front of you um, within water services basically reflect the table I was presented right. as part of the water budget. Yep. So charge per month and a cubic meter charge. And the same thing with the wastewater, uh, wastewater charges. And we've also highlighted the changes to the monthly fees for the hamlets of Buford, Kavanaugh, Sunnybrook, Luma, and Rule of you and other customers within the service area not connected to water services but connected to the wastewater services, as well as the proposed rate for access to NISCU transfer station as well. Questions um, that, on any of those changes? Councillor Lewis? What were the lagoon fees for the wastewater for the hamlets? What was the previous? Because I see that's gone up to 51.75 oh, a month. Do you happen to have it handy? Um, Pardon me? Just let me, I'll go back to, should be in here. Okay. So in 2022, the charge was $49.80. Okay. 49.80? 49.80. So yes. Thank you. Dollar. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, on to, yes, you may. Well, we are. Yes. Nine years ago, that was $39 for the lagoon. So they've gone up $10 in nine years. So pretty darn reasonable. Yeah. And you're getting reserve funding from those fees as well. So good work. Yeah. Okay. Um, part two, the wastewater rates, the overstrengths have increased. Yeah. These are charges that we received directly from Alberta Capital Region okay. Wastewater Commission and simply flow through. This is a flow through charge, no pun intended. <laughs> last one, Des, you were uh, served with a compliment at the last sewage commission with the work that you've done um, and the upgrades you've done here. And you're leading the way, allegedly, with the other regions on overstrength and the work that you're doing. So okay. you're being recognized and you're doing something right that the actual administration there uh, pointed out um, that you've set a standard. So thanks for that. Excellent. Oh, that's we won't be able to do those sort of things without council provided funding. So uh, I'm glad that council has the uh, buy buys into our vision and understands what needs to be done and allows us to become leaders in the region. So thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions, Mr. Mariglod. Um, just want to uh, say we appreciate your work on this. We know you don't have a utilities manager at this time. You're able to step up and do the work here for council and we appreciate all of that as well. I'd also like to thank finance group, they've been a tremendous assistance in developing this budget. Um, specifically, Brooks put a lot of time and effort in assisting yep. me with this. So um, I want to specifically name her because she's- please, please pass on our compliments. She's been outstanding. And I'll just let you know that you have been the snappiest dresser so far. It's been noticed, not, not you. Yes, yeah. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Speaking about snappy dressers, let's move on to enforcement services, if I can. So enforcement services is in tab 15, one five. If not snappy, then the safest dresser we've had today. Thank you, everyone. Whenever you're ready. I believe we start with our operational plan here. And... Oh. Madam Council and Council members, um, you'll see that our service, uh, our operational services plan is similar to the one last year. We've made some changes this year to align with the new strategic plan that Council's adopted for the next period. Um, we have our service areas are as follows. Uh, leadership and administration, which is self-explanatory. You see some of the details that are outlined there. Um, the bylaw enforcement and animal control is one of the other five areas. We have enhanced policing, which uh, liaises with our local law enforcement partners with the RCMP. 
Um, we have a regional training component to that. Uh, we, we host and provide training services for our, our regional partners. And of course, uh, the vast majority of what we do, which is traffic safety in our region, is the final uh, component of our operational plan. Any questions about those first five before I move on? Any questions about those? They're, they are pretty standard for what we've seen from your department. So move on. We've updated our uh, organizational chart, and uh, you'll see that um, uh, the department head is in charge of uh, administrative assistant, a senior peace officer, some other peace officers, and our bylaw enforcement officers. Uh, so we haven't uh, changed that for uh, the past couple of years, and we're not forecasting to do so either. Under our uh, strategic priorities. We we, oh, sorry. So I was just wondering, and Tani is wondering as well, why you have a senior peace officer broken out as a different. Is, yeah. is, is yes. that an age thing? Because it, it's ageist if it is. Uh, no, uh, it, that is uh, purely coincidental. Okay. Um, okay. I will say that uh, uh, as per the peace officer program, there is a component of approvals okay. uh, for reports and accountability. And so the uh, three peace officers are directly accountable to that person. Okay. And I'm accountable to all of them. All right. So yeah. thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> um, or they're accountable to me, I should say. Yes, thank you. Uh, strategic priorities one to five there that you see uh, are again aligned with the current uh, uh, council priorities as well. So uh, the first one being promoting enhanced traffic safety. Uh, the second one is the assistance uh, to emergency services, including police, fire, EMS, and of course, emergency management in, in case things uh, turn up long term. Uh, goal number three is the uh, build, uh, building strengthen, build and strengthen community relationships and support meaningful community engagement. Um, uh, followed by goal number four, which is promoting public safety on bodies of water and off highway lands as well. So not just our roads. Uh, and number five is responding to property concerns and promoting compliance as much as we can. And we've been quite successful in doing so. With those in mind, those are our five uh, strategic priority goals. Uh, we break it down uh, into what we refer to as an action plan. I'll go through just a couple of uh, highlights if that's okay, and then ask for any questions. Um, We've made some adjustments to the, uh, uh, just referring now to um, page three in my booklet, but it's strategic yep. uh, strategy 1.1. And uh, the minimum uh, KPIs for dedicated traffic operations for year uh, being 700. Uh, and we uh, will be conducting, uh, again, patrols in uh, road band areas as well, uh, that being 1,200. And then uh, complementing our cargo securement program doing a minimum of uh, 100 traffic stops or uh, campaign uh, program operations and in conjunction with our cargo securement program and awareness campaign. So we're, we're reaching out and uh, having those engagements uh, with uh, members of the public who use our roadway services. Uh, strategy 1.2 near the bottom of that same page, uh, we want to reach out and, and and have at least 2,000 patrols in hotspots. So in addition to the areas that we just talked about, uh, there are requests for services in a number of different locations and roadways uh, across the county. And we hear those and we, uh, we record those and we uh, make sure that our peace officers are spending time there. And then we record those. And those are automatically recorded through our GPS system. Moving on to the next page, uh, strategy 1.3. We obviously participate and we support special events. Uh, there uh, is one coming up this weekend, for example, the Santa Claus Parade. Uh, so we want to be we wanna make sure that we're a part of that as well. Uh, we work not solely uh, in those areas, but with our, our uh, enforcement and municipal partners as well. Strategy, uh, sorry, goal two, and including 2.1 and 2.2, uh, refer to um, the... Uh, ongoing uh, support that we provide for traffic control during emergencies and assisting police, fire, and EMS, not just emergencies, but other things as well when they're conducting their own investigations. 2.2, uh, uh, referring to the, some of the courses that we're involved in, whether we host them or provide them, uh, that's weights and dimensions, uh, radar, and uh, we also 
assess the uh, enhanced policing services. So uh, special events such as uh, Christmas time and, and other things that uh, the community asks us to do, and we work those uh, plans out with the RCMP. Goal number three, uh, we have strategy 3.1 uh, that includes the uh, uh, summary of activities that we provide to the, uh, the body of uh, the Protective Services Committee. Um, we do that five times a year in conjunction with the RCMP reports as well. And of course, the annual evaluation of our uh, uh, document, the Community Peace Officer Performance Plan, which we're, uh, we're very proud of and that we uh, has been a guiding uh, document for the past couple of years. Goal number four, uh, strategy uh, 4.1, uh, that uh, focuses on both summer and uh, well, summer boat uh, and off highway vehicle programs. Um, and that's uh, a lot of that has to do with weather, but all, and also the uh, availability of of our uh, partnerships with um, uh, Transport Canada and things of that nature. So we uh, we do both on wa on water and uh, shoreline operations for boat operations and uh, patrols uh, to. Uh, uh, enforce our off-highway vehicle regulations. Councillor Lewis has a question. Just for clarity, off-highway lands would be like MR reserves? Yes, anything that's not road okay. and that uh, the public may or may not have authority to access. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You bet. Uh, goal number five and the final one is the uh, addressing a nuisance and unsightly premises. Uh, this is a proactive program, although we do um, address complaint. Uh, this is addressed through complaints, I should say. Uh, we do have some customers that uh, need uh, reminders periodically that we uh, engage with as well. And so uh, we want to try to uh, bring those to their attention before they become a, a problem. And we, we, we know that if we can address those uh, earlier on, uh, they are much uh, easier to, uh, to uh, fix, if you will, or achieve some sort of uh, uh, compliance before they get much worse. Um, and that includes the uh, this year, and thank you to this council for the approval of our urban standards uh, uh, bylaw and uh, in the select areas that they are affecting. And uh, we're already uh, reaching out to those communities to uh, educate them on that, those regulations that have come into place now, but will be uh, strictly enforced uh, as soon as the snow disappears in the spring of 2023. And of course, that also includes the uh, animal control bylaw that we're working on. I believe uh, we're going to meet here tomorrow to talk about that in a workshop. Okay. Those are the uh, five strategic goals that I provide. Any questions about those? I, I'm seeing none. Thank you. That's a clear explanation of the work that you do. Mm -hmm. Very good. I, I believe Leadership we're... and administration. Yeah, and um, so I will uh, focus primarily on the things that uh, we do and then a little bit of changes that we have. So uh, our service overview includes, of course, investigating complaints uh, from members of our community, both visitors and residents, uh, providing uh, dog control services, uh, promoting traffic safety, uh, supporting crime prevention through uh, community outreach and partnerships with our uh, RCMP partners and uh, providing support to the other emergency services, uh, similar to what we've already mentioned. Um, and this includes, uh, what you see here includes the earning and benefits for the staff that participate in these programs. Um, I believe, would you like me to speak a little bit on the summary of changes as well? Um, yeah, just if you wanna just highlight them, council will ask questions if they see fit. Very good. Um, there's a, a Slight difference in the transfer uh, from reserves that you see reflected into this budget. Um, and the earnings and benefits are uh, the way they've, they've uh, been outlined in this document. Um, slight increase in the professional development. Uh, that's not still not reaching our pre-COVID right. uh, budget, but uh, we're reaching there slowly over time. Um, the other increase is to do with our in-car video cameras. Um, they are... Uh, Effectively, uh, at any moment now, uh, if there's a failure, there is no way to uh, fix or get okay. uh, parts for them. And so we're looking at a longer term solution. Uh, I think we've come up with an outstanding opportunity to <laughs> spread spread that cost out over a five year period. And so this is 
reflected in that as well. Okay. You see a small increase in the uh, amount of, uh, um, I guess, uh, maintenance and equipment parts for our vehicles. Uh, we're not planning on uh, purchasing any capital, but we want to make sure that we take care of the ones that we have. So those are the changes that we have in that budget. Okay, go ahead. Uh, clarification, uh, within your budget, is that the, um, do you include what we pay to the province now for the alleged rural, um, I guess, rural supplement? Is that in the enhanced policing agreement or is that in a different budget, not enforcement? And how, how Yeah, you... it's in enhanced. It's in, uh, it's two pages from now. Yeah. Okay. okay. Substantial increase this year as well. Uh, so, yeah, absolutely. You are absolutely correct. Yeah. And we're almost there. Yeah. Uh, for the next um, service overview, it's uh, bylaw enforcement and uh, animal control. Um, we have pro projected a very small increase in the uh, false alarm revenue. That's uh, our bylaw that uh, after the first uh, uh, false alarm each year for uh, either commercial or residential district, there's a, a fee that we charge them and uh, things are picking up a little bit. So uh, we do see a, a minor increase in the false alarm revenue projections. Uh, and that's just simply to uh, align with the uh, past three years here. And also uh, some vet fees and medical supplies that we incur when we're dealing with the, uh, again, increase in volume of animal control. Questions on bylaws or animal control? Oh. Enhanced policing. This is where uh, Councillor Smith gave us a preview of the uh, the costs. So um, there's a, a projected increase of uh, nearly five hundred thousand dollars for the uh, police funding model. Uh, these are uh, numbers that come straight from the province. They are, uh, for all intents and purposes, dictated to uh, municipalities uh, based on their funding uh, formula. And um, there's a projected increase of for the enhanced policing officer that's uh, um, that we have. So and we also uh, manage the uh, school resource officer funding that uh, comes straight from 100% of that comes from Black Gold School Divisions. Okay. Any questions on enhanced policing or comments? Um, are you seeing any enhanced policing from the province? I sure don't down my road. I do see Ladue County enforcement officers out. I don't see the RCMP for the extra $1.5 million per year now. This reminds me on the occasion that uh, someone from another jurisdiction comes to talk about an investigation in another municipality and they want to get our opinion on that. Uh, I, I, so my answer is, is pretty simple. I would never want to... Uh, uh, comment on something that I'm not completely aware of. Um, I have similar observations to yours, but those are simple of mine. Uh, it doesn't mean that's a true reflection of what's actually happening in the district. I know that we uh, have a new enhanced police officer that's dedicated to the rural area. Um, I haven't physically met that person yet, but uh, they are around and uh, we do communicate uh, on uh, electronically. So just to follow up. So I thank you for your professional opinion, not commenting on, I guess my job as a politician is to make those comments, sometimes with not all the background information that goes through, but I do appreciate uh, at least the base information of what you're seeing out there. For sure. Thank you. Regional training. Regional training, there's uh, been a minor decrease in the cost of food associated with that, that we budget. So it's very, very small. Will we be expecting, I assume, much like you talked about uh, professional development, more of that being in person, we'd expect a bit of an uptick on this as well with people coming out after the COVID? Yeah, COVID you know, I will say that uh, the uh, Weights and Dimensions course has never changed okay. when it comes to the demand. It's, cool. it's always there. Okay. Uh, I will say the one change that has happened with that course is that it's now required to be uh, endorsed by Solicitor General. Oh, and so we went through uh, the first review of our program. Uh, they've given us some feedback. We're crossing our fingers that we're able to uh, meet some of those uh, feedback needs before it actually gets endorsed before our next one, which is usually scheduled in the first quarter of the year. So uh, they've become more strict on that, which is ironic because the other more readily enforceable uh, courses, for example, radar and LIDAR are not regulated in any way, shape or form in this province. Yeah. All right, enforcement service traffic safety. 
Yeah, um, you'll see uh, the explanation there when it comes to the number of kilometers of residential and industrial roadways uh, and um, collector roads that we we patrol. Uh, that hasn't changed, but I, you know, as mentioned before, we do have hot spots and, and things of that nature that we need to be frequently on. Uh, there's mention here in my summary of the cargo securement program and the banned roads. Um, that we have uh, during different times of year. Um, cargo securement is pretty much year round, but it's highlighted in the uh, summer months. Of course, soft highway vehicle patrols and boat patrols on the bodies of water, including Wizard Lake and Pigeon Lake and North, uh, North Saskatchewan River on occasion when, when needed. Um, and traffic control parades and uh, also assisting with emergency services, which always takes priority. Um, you'll see uh, very little, if any, change here. Um, we're hoping to have things uh, as, as uh, quiet and calm and uh, consistent as possible compared to 2022. Okay. Thank you. Um, do we have any fees and charges? Like, well, oh, there it is. Yep, page four. Page four, there nine. are no changes. There are no changes. Do we don't have to look. Okay, well, thank you for that, uh, Mr. Nelson. We appreciate uh, the summary, uh, your budget. We know that everybody is working on a tight budget this year, and we really appreciate that as we work to try and keep things affordable uh, for our residents and our businesses, but ensure that we still have the safety we need. So thank you to you and your staff. Thank you for your support. I don't believe we have uh, the chief here, but we have the deputy. Come on, Tyler. Welcome. Tab 18, Fire Services. Good afternoon, Council. And you can do a quick overview of your operational plan into your organizational chart and then your priorities, please. For sure. Um, our operational plan uh, hasn't really changed a whole lot. We tend to still go to fires and car accidents and work with, with what we have to. Uh, we have six service areas, uh, leadership administration, emergency management, fleet facilities, operations, public safety, education, safety codes, and training. Um, those encompass what we do in, in fire services. Uh, and each of those areas are covered by um, a number of uh, staff, um, as you see on the org chart, um, so we have fire, uh, the fire chief, obviously, administrative assistant, um, and then we have four deputy fire chiefs, um, same as we have in the past, uh, fire prevention, public education, uh, fleet logistics, training and emergency management, and then operations. Um, underneath prevention, we have one uh, prevention, uh, fire prevention officer. And then under fleet and logistics, we have a fleet and equipment coordinator and a heavy duty mechanic. So it, it looks on the on the chart like we have a lot of paid on call firefighters, but I understand we're always looking and we need to continue to recruit. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. Um, we have targets, which are what's on showing on there. Uh, that's where we'd like to be yeah. to ensure that we, we can provide the best service that we can uh, with available resources. But there's always transition and, and uh, we're always in a, a recruitment mode to, to bring on uh, the required new people. Okay. Um, and then underneath operations, so we talk about the, the paid on call, the light blue boxes there. We also have the platoon chief and four full-time firefighters that are at out of station nine here in Nisku. Any specific questions? Anything on the, no, not so far. Okay. So we'll move into our uh, strategic priorities. Uh, so our first goal is maintaining a safe county. I think that's the most important thing that uh, we make sure that that's what we're, we're here to do and, and we do that. So our strategy is to distribute public education resources at a community event to build emergency preparedness and resili resiliency within the community. Um, some of the actions and deliverables that we're gonna help get us there. Uh, fire safety and emergency preparedness presentations at community events and schools within the county. Uh, this will be delivered by Q2 of 2023. We provided, and this is based on this year actually, and we're going to continue with this, but provided 40 fire prevention presentations to students within Leduc County. Yep. Does that include uh, last year? I think 
you did the party program in New Sarepta for the first time. The kids used to be bussed into Leduc. Is that within your fire safety and emergency presentations? So that is within that, yes. That's yeah, really yeah and we're going to hopefully build on that program and, and continue with that. Really, really positively commented by the school, the fire chief, that New Sarepta Fire Department took that component over in that, and maybe it's something that can go out into the high schools, uh, but greatly appreciated by the community. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. Um, our next action would be provide emergency preparedness information to the public and businesses within Leduc County, uh, again, by Q2 2023. So we'd look to host two emergency preparedness open houses for Leduc County residents and businesses. So one in the east and one in the west. Perfect. Okay. Um, moving on to goal two, demonstrate leadership in regional initiatives and organizations. Uh, establish a sub-regional emergency management partnership with the municipalities within Leduc County that is able to manage an event or a response in any of the participating municipalities. And our actions are looking at um, signing a sub-regional emergency management agreement with all participating municipalities. Um, and obviously having that ratified agreement would be our, our deliverable. And then training together that entire sub-regional group um, through we, we've indicated three training events um, at this time and that's some ICS courses as well as tabletop exercises. Have we started this work already? Is this the work that's fallen out yep. of the consultant and it was too expensive so we're working we just decided we would work on this together? Yes Madam Chair the, the privilege of working with our small urbans is we move as fast as our slowest partner. Okay, absolutely. But I'm glad we're still pushing forward on that. It's really important. Yes, I, I believe there's actually even discussions even this week continuing okay. with that. So any other questions? On strategic oh, Councillor Lewis? Your goal three is the same as goal two. Yes, thank you. I have that recorded as a okay. an interim approved budget adjustment. <laughs> Um, one of the goals that we was here before, and I, I don't want to be that person, but I was so excited about it was about sort of, and it might be in, it might be folded into uh, the presentations, was that notion of that junior firefighter or that getting out there and trying to encourage some sort of high school uh, collaboration there is, could that be folded in there? I thought it was for a sure. great way. Let's grow our own firefighters, so for, to speak. For sure, um, Madam Mayor. Um, we didn't, it didn't get put in there this year. Um, it was something that we had pre COVID that we were just right. starting to get the ball yep. rolling and COVID happened. Um, we're still working with the schools, Perfect. but trying to allow them the opportunity to, to catch up where they need to be before we start adding another no, thing onto their great, plate. Great observation. <laughs> my, my niece is a high school teacher and she said kids coming back after COVID had some great deficits to make up. So sure. I get it. That is, that is wise. One thing that I can say through those 40 fire prevention um, presentations we've done, um, that piece was discussed oh, at good. those higher higher grade levels um, to kind of get a feel of where where they're at. And, and I think there is a desire there, but again, we just okay. want to make sure the capacity is there. Absolutely. Good answer. Okay, on to your, um, right into leadership and administration. Um, and just highlight some of the changes that you have happening here. So again, uh, not a huge change in the service overview. I'm not sure if we're, are we reading, just, just touch on it. So again, providing that 24 hour fire service across the county um, to NISCU, to the Edmonton International Airport. Um, in the leadership and administration um, service area, this includes the uh, earnings and benefits um, for the full-time staff as well, okay. which is a team of 13 at this point. All right. Um, going down to the summary of changes, um, there's, a, there's an increase in cost share revenue and recoveries to align with actuals. So this is around um, responses on the highway and, yep. and whatnot. Uh, increase, again, in the, the mutual aid responses, revenue due to additional NISCU South District responses. So um, another truck out there um, supporting uh, the highway is, is providing that increased, um, slight increased revenue. Um, to 100 increase related to uh, changes in earnings and benefits. 
to two hundred uh, four thousand dollar increase in insurance due to a ten percent increase, which I think we've all seen across the board. Um, decrease, that, if, if I may, is yep. that just vehicle insurance or is it other insurance for specific firefighter? Oh, there we go. Yeah. Uh, the insurance that went up by the 10% was specific to the vehicle and the facilities. Some of our other areas were slightly lower, but definitely seeing right. it in and, that. And because these are clearly their facilities, it doesn't get put over three or four departments. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, slight decrease in professional services just to align with actuals. Um, these are our, our various courses and mm -hmm. development of firefighters. Uh, two, three hundred uh, decrease in cost share with the village of Warbird. And this is just to align with what we've historically been billing them for those costs. Um, that number pretty much stayed the same historically um, with, with some slight fluctuations. And this is just going to give a better idea of what we expect to, to be charging. Uh, two dash five hundred uh, seven thousand decrease in other supplies uh, because it was reallocated. Um, I'm not a big fan of the other categories. We try and put things where they're actually um, going to be a good descriptor of what it is. So um, six thousand dollar increase in scheduling software. Uh, this is uh, to do with our, our full time trying to schedule, make sure that we have um, vacancies filled when, oh, okay. when there's yeah. holidays and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, minor decrease in food and computer supplies to align with actuals, and then our increase in contract expenses uh, at Edmonton National Airport. That's to our 2023 okay. contract, 82,900. Any questions on any of those numbers or changes? I am seeing none. On to emergency management. So emergency management uh, has been very busy the last few years. Um, this is the area that deals with those larger type events and, and planning for those larger events and how to manage those um, through our municipal emergency management plan and related training to, to staff, county staff. A um, few changes, 1-500, uh, we've decreased in the building rental revenue to align with actuals. Um, and this just has to do with um radio tower licenses okay. and stuff like that a minor increase in dispatch services to align uh, with actuals but also um this is directly related to the next gen 911 so as dispatch centers are having to get on board of next gen 911 through the CRTC they're having to increase costs because they have to uh, provide different services okay uh, $13,000 increase in utility costs to align with actuals. Um, this has to do with, um, I know it's not so much the power and gas utilities. It's a more, more on the water and sewer in the municipalities that we have fire stations. Oh, right. So we don't have oh, okay. gotcha. um, signed rate agreements and whatnot. So if Thorsby has a high water rate, yep. then you're, you're paying a higher water yep. rate. Got it. Okay. Um, not what I'm saying they do. I'm just saying if they did. If they did. Uh, $4,000 increase in computer uh, miscellaneous supplies to align with actuals. Uh, this is a big chunk of that is a dedicated uh, printer that's not on the network for emergency management. Okay. So through our Great. tabletop exercises, we've recognized when a laptop that's not normally connected to the network comes in, they have no way of printing forms and documents. Got it. Makes sense. Okay. Fleet and facilities. Uh, this is obviously where we're going to be covering off all of our uh, rolling assets, as well as the fixed facilities, um, ensuring the maintenance and upkeep of those is ready and, and prepared to respond to emergencies. Uh, some major uh, or minor changes, sorry, increase in emergency medical services trailer rental revenue, again, to align with actuals, small increase. Uh, we just signed a new agreement with them in Warburg this year. A minor increase in repairs and maintenance to vehicles across the board, uh, totaling $970. Um, when we get into 2500, uh, 5000 increase in utilities to align with actuals. Again, we talked about that. Uh, the increase in cost um, to purchase firefighter turnout gear due to rising costs of suppliers. That's one of our um, single biggest equipment costs. And, and we've seen um, those costs inflating uh, due to 
all of our regular inflation. 7,000 increase in fuel uh, due to increased fuel prices, uh, $21,000 decrease in tire expenses. Now, how are you managing that, sir? Are you just not buying any tires this year? It, it's based on as needed. So, okay. as, so you looked at the, the, yeah. the state of everything, you had yeah. money put aside, and you're saying we need 21000 less. Yep. Good and for you. Uh, Appreciate it. County manager keeps a pretty close eye on tires. $3,000 decrease in janitorial supplies uh, for fire stations, again, to align with actuals, and a $3,000 decrease in building supplies to align with actuals. Some of these things are... are small little budget lines that were for each of the stations that weren't really being utilized. So we Tyler, found- Do you know off your top of your head how many buildings you actually operate? So we have- um, NISCU. NISCU, current NISCU station, the NISCU South District station, New Sarepta, Kalmar, and Thorsby, as well as the St. Francis Tower site, Mulhurst Tower site. Um, those are the ones that we manage directly. Uh, the share. Warburg is uh, okay. is a share, but we deal with the ma the maintenance of that right. facility through our budget. Right. So it is a, a lot of maintenance on those buildings as well, which makes sense why those numbers have are so they fluctuate and some of them are high. Okay. okay. Thank okay. you. Operations. So this is where um, our 130 paid on call firefighters sit. Um, the preparing them to respond to emergencies, uh, making sure that they're able to go and attend mandatory weekly training um, and, and working with our other regional partners. Increase in mutual aid highway rescue revenue for the NISCU, New Strip and Kalmar districts. Um, again, just aligning with actuals. So these are, again, our revenues from responding to car accidents on the highways. Um, under the expenses to... To 100, sorry, increase related to changes in earnings and benefits, uh, increase in cost share with the city of Leduc. Uh, this isn't an increased um, cost from them, but it's an increase due to call volumes. So, so they invoice us per call. So the more calls that we see, the higher that that annual cost is going so to be. So we don't have mutual aid with them. We actually have a cost share. There, there's a, a mutual aid agreement that has a cost a fee tied to it Perfect. for them to, to, prove up, to respond uh, into Ladue County for us. Thank you. Okay. Increased in food uh, for firefighters responding to emergency calls due to an increased number of responses. So when we have calls it's Okay, over... you feed them all you need. That's, I'm glad <laughs> they're out there working. We, we do have some parameters around it just to ensure that um, it's being managed. Um, um public safety education and safety codes so this is where we're gonna um cover off our safety codes obviously um fuel storage tanks um, planning and development department to review um their permits whenever a, a development permit comes through um we put our eyes across it as well to ensure that 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 safety piece is taken care of uh, according to the safety codes uh, requirements um decrease in advertising uh, and fire prevention, uh, fire prevention, sorry, falls under here as well. Uh, just finding um, other ways of advertising fire prevention other than just putting it in the, the newspaper right. and stuff like that, trying to um, focus on those target audiences that, that we're trying to reach. Like farmers who are burning, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Speaking from experience at my house. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, training. Um, obviously, uh, having 100 and roughly 130 firefighters uh, requires a little bit of training to make sure that they're prepared to respond um, safely, effectively, and in a timely manner. Uh, we do have some revenue that, that we bring in uh, through a re regional training facility. Um, we did decrease that. We're not quite seeing the rebound after COVID okay. um, for regional use of the training facility. Uh, that being said, I understand Beaumont also just opened a training ground, so they may be utilizing that a little bit more. So okay. um, hopefully we see that come back, but for now we're, we're gonna reduce that at this point. Go ahead. Yeah. Administration, wasn't uh, the training allowance 
reintroduced by the provincial government. I know it's not a lot, but is it per person? And is that a potential yeah. to grow our training center again? Yeah, it might help. The, the grant's been brought back. We just got a, actually a letter uh, recently on that. So. Okay. Okay. Um, increase in professional development as conferences are expected to be in person again. Um, we, we did have a $2,000 decrease in um, obviously less use on the training facility requires less inputs right. on expenses. So um, not using as much propane on the props, not using as much construction materials for, for those props as well. So we've reduced all of that to, to offset the decrease in revenue as well. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, fees and charges. One. Sorry. There's no changes. Three. But I, I do have a question, even though there's no changes. You have a $7,000 increase in fuel, but when it comes to going out and doing inspections and things, we haven't passed that on as a, as a charge or as an increase. Um, I, for, I actually didn't ask it in any of the other ones where there's been an increase in our costs. Do you see it as just being a marginal increase that, you know, you'd only have to put a few cents on each one to make it more? I would say in the industrial park, um, just off the top of my head, I think this year to date, there's been about 100 to 150 inspections oh, okay. in the park. So, so it if we were to try and it would be cents on that. No, nope, that's fair. I thought I would ask because everybody yep. else passes on fire or that that um, off to us. Um, so thank you for that information. Um, thank you to your team for putting together the budget document for us. Um, as I've said to many other people, I know that we set a very um, high standard to try to keep to 3%, which means you don't get everything that you ask for. Um, but we do appreciate your budget, the work and the work of your staff uh, to bring it forward. And we appreciate your presentation today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Great. Now on to snappy dressers. Oh, it's great. Planning and development, 22. Good afternoon, Madam uh, and Chair. And I, I will be charging a dollar for every acronym used. <laughs> I wish I would have known that sooner, Madam Chair. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Whenever you're ready, Grant. <laughs> yeah, good. Um, Madam Chair, members of Council, just looking at the operating plan for planning development uh, for 2023. Um, perhaps we can just kind of look at the, the org chart. Um, no major changes here, Madam Chair. This is the same general structure that we've had. We've got 29 FTEs in planning development. That's been pretty consistent over the last few years. And so you'll see reflected here the, the four distinct work groups that we have in planning development, starting with regional long range planning, uh, which looks after all of our, as the name would suggest, all of our long range policy development, municipal development plan, area structure planning, all the statutory planning work. Also the regional work and support at the EMRB as well. Oh, there's an acronym, sorry, Madam Chair. Um, and then uh, development services, Madam Chair, is the kind of regulatory arm, if you will. So um, development approval, subdivision approval, and then safety codes is um, uh, administration of safety codes act and um, compliance monitoring in, in that regard. And then economic development is, I think, well known to council. It's essentially growing the economy and attracting uh, investment to the county and ensuring that we're investment ready. So, looking at our our priorities, Madam Chair, there's a number of strategic priorities that are are shown here in the in the plan. There's three strategic uh, strategic priorities that are connected directly to council's strategic plan, and two that are we've identified as departmental goals. And so there's a, a total of ten actions that are noted here. And of course, this doesn't provide the sum total of all the work we're going to do in 2023. But these are what we would regard as the highlights and the um, the actions and the strategies of strategic importance to the county. And so looking at these actions and strategies, um, starting with goal number one, which deals with enabling increased economic growth and diversification in the county. The first action, the first two actions actually relate directly to the BEC project. 
And the first one of those is specifically related to the business accelerator function of that facility. Councilor Smith? Uh, is there any more fundy, uh, funding under, is it Prairie Can? Or is that dried up now from the coal fund? Round one, uh, that's just round one. Um, Madam Chair, through you, the specific fund from which the project is currently funded is ending as of the end of March of 2023. But we do understand there's another stream coming and another window opening through Prairie Scan uh, that looks like it could fit this program quite well. So we're, we're quite hopeful that we'll have the opportunity to have the second year of this program funded through that. Um, but there'll be an application process involved with that and we'll have to make that case. Through. And just to follow through, if I may, it might be prudent for our CAO to send a letter to the federal minister just thanking for it. And, and, and again, restating that the coal transition is in a... 700 day transition, it's a long time. And the minister had agreed when I met with them in October that the funding needs to continue and Ladue County is currently on his mind. So it'd be nice if they, they're looking for budget dollars um, to go in. So again, as we look at our budget going out, it'd be nice if there was a few other dollars that could definitely forward what you're doing, the good work you're doing here, plus subsidizing our operations. Thanks. I also think, if I may, uh, Mr. Bain, just before you continue, that I think Leduc County has demonstrated over and over again that we are mindful of the grant money we get. We report back in a timely manner. We ensure that it is all accounted for, whether it's Iris or for this project or the Spine Road. We're we're good. Um, we're good stewards of the money that we're given, and I think that will help us in this next round as well. Or at least that's what I'm yep. going to say. <laughs> Absolutely, Madam Chair, I would say that's accurate. And so the second action here in relation to that project, Madam Chair, is the, the business retention expansion component of that work. So there's sort of two main deliverables that come out of that work. One is around the, the business accelerator and shared space aspect, and then there's the business retention expansion. So we want to be sure we're covering both of those in our deliverables for 2023. We'll be reporting out on those um, in due course. And then moving down uh, under goal two, um, which is to build economic res resilience in the county, strategy 2.1 relates to the Economic Development Summit in 2023. So this would be the third um, year for uh, delivering this particular item. We wanna take a bit of a different approach for this for 2023, a little, I'd say a little more sophisticated approach. There's actually a new initiative associated with, uh, with this del delivering on this item in 2023, Madam Chair. So Perfect. We're, um, we're planning to move forward with that. And then moving down, and if I'm skipping items that council wants to know more about, then- Absolutely, we've just been asking questions as we've needed, Mr. Mr. Bant, Very Bain. Good. Thank you. Uh, goal four, Madam Chair, is land use bylaw. So I wanted to make reference to this land use bylaw review. This, so this is this work has been going on mainly background work and gathering and information, researching, uh, drafting new regulations. There's been one round of public consultation done on this work already um, in 2021. So this project will be out in the daylight in, um, in a big way in 2023. So we've got some deliverables that are noted here in relation to that project. And it's very important that we encourage as many people as we can to get out and participate in this because it's really about how we want to be using the land and how we don't want to be losing using the land across Leduc County. It's critically important. This is where the rubber hits the road, Madam Chair. These are regulations we're talking about. Critically important. Strategy 4.2 outlines a number of um, policy initiatives. So creating a new area structure plan for the for an area of North Nisku. So there's an area of North Nisku north of Township Road 510, south of 41st Ave that doesn't have statutory planning in place at the moment. So this is part of our long-term non-residential land supply. We want to be sure we're investment ready. That's this, this is part of that work. And then completion of the Central Nisku Area Redevelopment Plan. Um, council has seen some reporting on that uh, over the duration of that project. We anticipate completing that in mid-2023. And then carrying out the interim review for the Municipal Development Plan as well. That document was approved 2019. So it's just kind of a follow-up interim review with, with limited scope. Council recently approved project charter for that. So that is the operating plan, Madam Chair, if there are any further questions on that material. 
Well, I appreciate I appreciate what's in here. Um, again, like with everyone else, these are the highlights. This isn't just the work you do. This is the new work that you're going to take on, correct? And we don't That's give you correct. a list of work you're not you're going to stop doing either. So <laughs> we get it. Yes. So let's move on to your uh, planning and development leadership and administration page. Yep, absolutely. So looking at the financial information and the the explanations provided here for changes over 2022, um, there is a, a change in relation to earnings and benefits. So what what you're seeing here, this is so this is shown as an increase. I think it's actually a decrease if I yeah reading this properly. Um, so. Yeah, yeah. The decrease in salaries and benefits is uh, reflecting a, just an accounting essentially okay. for the economic development staff now are reported and shown under the economic development group. Okay. They used to be shown here. And there's an increase here for professional development as well. It's um, fairly consistent that we anticipate having some training opportunities delivered in person. So there's some costs associated with that. And an increase in uh, sponsorship that's reflecting a move over from the finance department. Um, that ten thousand dollars is specifically for the Beaver Hills Biosphere Initiative. Uh, so that's the leadership and admin section. I, just, I, maybe yeah. this is this isn't a question for you, uh, Mr. Bain. It's a question for Ms. Weiss. I am I am absolutely agog at the increase in the bank charges. I'm, number one, I'm surprised that we pay fifteen thousand dollars over a thousand dollar a year for bank charges in this one department, and it's going to go up four thousand dollars. Uh, and I, I'm assuming that's just a straight flow through. Is that our total bank charges, or is it more? No, there's. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. There is merchant fees also in right. general administration where we're seeing increases. This goes back to the finance operational plan where I'm saying I see it as a priority that we need to look at these merchant fees. Yes. And so Absolutely. this is part of why. Yeah. Let's just go back to writing checks. <laughs> Ms. Glamosco. <laughs> um, just in reference to that, you know, the one thing with moving away somewhat with doing accounts receivable and invoicing is our you know, we're not yeah. running into the work associated with collections. Right. So while you might be increasing oh, okay. some Good merchant point. fees, yeah. you also aren't chasing or having uncollectible revenue. So, so it is uh, a balance, but there is that, that benefit. It's to a it. sticker shock. Thing That's right. Me. Okay. Thank you. Um, development services. Development services, Madam Chair, there's an increase noted there for earnings and benefits for 2023. For the, the $50,000 increase below that um, is mostly related to um, some funds that we've budgeted to provide for some contracted services. So this is a past practice that we used to do and we haven't done for the past couple of years, but it allows us to bring in outside help for um, managing high volume of development permits during peak time. So yep. sort of May, September period, we bring in outside help to make sure we're hitting our timelines with those files and then there's some minor increases for com some computer program related items there as well. and again I, I i do appreciate you know that we do bring in contracted services to help with that we pride ourselves in getting permits out on time and that's the way to do it let's not just have somebody else sitting here we'll hire somebody during peak times when peak time's over they can find another job somewhere else it is it is the model that we've used before with some success and it yeah. is Keep, Absolutely. Keep us moving all forward. Okay, um, service, uh, economic development, sorry. Economic development, there is, so there's a corresponding increase here for earnings and benefits. And this also reflects that we've gone up to four positions as well. And two of those are, are funded through the grant yep. for the project, the BEC project. Uh, but that reflects that increase. And then there's an increase in some operating costs around just general activities um, with more staff, we expect more activity, more business visits, more uh, work out in the community. So there's some travel related costs associated with that as well as some conferences and professional development. There's a, a minor increase to the Edmonton Global Shareholder contribution noted here as well. And then there's some um, additional sponsorship dollars that are noted here that have got moved over from that were centrally managed previously and are now showing up in economic development. Is is this our last increased Edmonton Global? 
or is it still more increases every year? I can't recall. My understanding, Madam Chair, is it's 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 been stable for the last year or two. It, there, so there was a three year ramp up to get yeah. to the full funding model, and we've been at that. I think this is our second year okay. currently that what we're in, where we're at the full fully funded. So I would expect it to be pretty consistent going forward. I feel like I own somebody at Edmonton Global at that much money. <laughs> <laughs> no I bought a Globonian. <laughs> Perhaps yes. Regional and long range planning. Yes, and so there's some there's some decreases here. There was one position that uh, got taken out of the org structure, an administrative position. Yeah. So there's some and there's some other changes that resulted in some decreases to that budget. And then there are some um, smaller increases related to just operational costs and expenses yeah. based on what we anticipate doing in 2023 and. Some of that's around professional development again. Well, uh, just a question, and it's a bit to you, maybe a little bit to Mr. Coleman as well. We know that we have issues with advertising. Are we finding things like the, the roadside signs working effectively? At least I see them. Sometimes I don't see what's in the paper or not in the paper. I mean, it, it is, I see that we have an increase because we need to have people involved in this. Um, are we are we getting through this crisis? Yeah, I, I think we are. I The road sign make a big difference they do I'm it's surprised. oddly enough it's a very basic sort of advertising but people don't look to social media or to the print media unless something interests them yeah and Agreed. it's amazing a drive home and you see hey wait a minute yeah. and then you will go to social media you'll go to the website you might go to the print media so or, or i will get a call about what's that so and i've gotten lots of those so it's funny you're right how something as simple as that has made a bit of a difference in that and yeah, so you know we, we appreciate that advertising continues to not only go up but be a challenge thank you yeah. safety codes safety codes madam chair the major difference here is on the revenue side and showing an increase in um, building permit revenue projections for 2023 and just as a point of interest, the current year to date building permit revenue for 2022 is around 1.4 million. Oh, wow. Uh, we budgeted 800,000 in 2022. So it's been a strong year. We anticipate that to continue. Um, most of that's been in North Nisku past years. The airport has been a big part of that, it's, but it's been actually Nisku the last couple of years. So we anticipate that continuing. Do we have the staff to keep up with, with the demand? We do, Madam Chair. Yeah, on the safety code side, for sure, it hasn't. We have it hasn't been a challenge from a staffing perspective. The number of permits is actually pretty consistent year okay. over year, last few years. But there's been some larger projects that have got our, our numbers up on the permit side in terms of revenues. So, yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Rick. When you first came on board, there were a hundred outstanding files that needed to be worked through. And again, just uh, further to the question that the mayor had about your capacity, are you seeing any pressures in growth in those difficult files that I think you assumed a hundred of them and you slayed that down to quite a small amount, but I'm just wondering, are you seeing an uptick um, and a list starting to grow um, with the staff you have, or are you staying on top and not, uh, not having pressure points for those to continue to maybe get larger and larger as I guess as some of the issues come in from right across the county. So Madam Chair, that's just for clarification, that's a reference to compliance enforcement files specifically. Is that the question? Well, within your department. So if I were to receive a complaint from a neighbor that there, you know, somebody uh, has, has a kennel, I guess that would be enforcement. Let me go, somebody's operating a business. Um, and before uh, you had a hundred derelict plot files when you first came to Ladue County and they've come down and we appreciate that. I'm just wondering again, as we come out of COVID and people are changing a little bit, are you seeing that list or that deficiency grow because your staff is doing so much work on the other sides of the file or is that yep. something that you're maintaining and confident that you're happy with right now? Uh, Madam Chair, I would say it ebbs and flows okay. uh, for sure. Um, I, if memory serves properly, I think several years ago we were pushing 200 of those files. I, I think I remember that list you're talking about now. It was it looked daunting and unattainable, but yeah. So it's it's a fraction of that now, Madam Chair. Uh, it, it, there's been a recent uptick, I would say, in terms of I don't have the numbers in front of me. I yeah. apologize. I can't speak to what our actual number of files are at the moment. But there's anecdotally, I can say with some certainty, there's been an uptick in activity around complaints, um, 
particularly neighbors, neighbor related complaints that have a land use component. And we, we tend to get drawn into those. And um, it, it takes a while to resolve some of those and they can be a resource draw for sure. And, and again, people are home more, working from home more, people notice more, people are grumpier. It's a whole bunch of things, unless you're on council and then you're not. All right, I think we're going to fees and charges and there's a lot of red on your sheets. Uh, page uh, page 11 of 19. It's not as bad as it looks, Madam Chair. I, I don't know, if I was a teacher, I'd give you a fail on this. <laughs> <laughs> She's pretty red, my friend. Don't grade me on this. Okay. Um, Madam Chair, what you're seeing here is a 3% increase across the board. Three? That, yes. Sorry, yeah, yeah, okay. That we're proposing for all of our fees and charges in the planning development section of the fees and charges bylaw. Uh, the last increase that was brought in in this area was 2020, and that was a 1.3% increase. It stayed, it so it stayed at that level since then. No increases in 21 or 22, and it was several years prior to 2020, I believe, as well. Um, so the intention here is to try to keep pace with inflation uh, to some degree, rather than make big jumps at a time. Uh, we felt 3% was a reasonable increment. Um, but that's what you're seeing here. And so where you're seeing round dollar figures, there is this, a round up or a round down to the nearest dollar essentially okay. for those fees. Yeah. Uh, no, I appreciate I appreciate the, the 3% across the board. It's fair and equitable. Like you said, it's keeping up. You can tie it to something, uh, which I don't know if inflation is only 3%, but good on you. Half of inflation at that's least. Pretty much. Yep. Any questions specifically on any of those? Uh, explanation was provided that it's across the board 3%. But there is a lot of red. Ms. Kamasko. Uh, just while we have Mr. Bain here, I was just going to pose the question around the four sectors. So with the labor force analysis, it the project profile document referenced um, the four sectors. So I was just wondering if Mr. Bain could just provide that answer to council. I can do that, Madam Chair. <laughs> I, I had a couple, I had a business. <laughs> yeah, so the four, so I should, just some context. So council has seen on a couple of occasions, the draft investment strategy. It hasn't been brought for you, before you for approval yet, but that, that'll be happening pretty soon. And so what you've seen are essentially three priority sectors is agri-food, um, manufacturing and energy, and then transportation logistics is identified as a support sector that makes all of those go actually. Um, so yeah, you, you'll see that document come back to you at a regular council right. meeting coming to you soon. And, and again, as we make decisions it's keeping in mind, how do we enable those three sectors to continue to grow here in Leduc County? Indeed. Any further questions for Mr. Bain? Thanks. Well, you got us at the end of the day. We might be a little less feisty now. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> as always, uh, thank you to you and your staff. I think it's one of the most diverse. You know, you and corporate services are very, very diverse in the amount of work that you do. Um, and as a manager, you do a good job of keeping an understanding of what everybody's doing all the time, which I know is very difficult. So uh, on behalf of council, thank you and your staff for putting together your budget. As I said to everyone else, I know you didn't get everything that you wanted or you thought you needed, but we hope that we'll be able to approve what you need to be able to work through next year for your, uh, not only your uh, department to be successful, but to help make the county successful. So thank you to everybody. Thank you for the support, Madam Chair. Thank you. Going to recess us uh, budget until Monday at 9.30. Is that correct? Um, thank you to all of you who joined us. We'll have a uh, recap on Monday morning and make some final decisions at that point. We've gone through all of the other departments. We are adjourned at uh, 3.52. Thank you.